Okay, it being six o'clock, I'm going to call to meeting this uh, call to order this select board meeting for April 8, 2024. And if you please join me in a pledge of allegiance. So before we get to our public service announcements, you'll notice a little bit of a difference up on, at this table this evening. Uh, we have a new member who was elected last week, Pat Maloney. Welcome to the board. Pat. And welcome back, George Dixon. Uh, congratulations to both of you. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm honored to be uh, appointed as chair for the coming year. So thank you to the other board members for that, that honor. And Aaron Drew is a new vice chair, and Pat is the new clerk. So with that, we will go to public service announcements. And, and before I do the public service announcements, my first honor as vice chair is to present you with this honor award plaque for your service last year as the chair. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. Yeah. Thank you. The microphone. Public service. There it is. The microphone. Hope I didn't hit you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so the Chelmsford Center for the Arts would like to invite everyone to karaoke sober edition. Uh, it is the every second Friday of the month from 7 to 10 p.m. Their admission is free and there are snacks and mocktails available for purchase. Um, it's sponsored by the Chelmsford Health Department. And from the Chelmsford Minuteman Company, we have an invite for the general public to join us on our 13th annual Patriots Day March from Chelmsford to Concord. Join the Min Chelmsford Minutemen, Boys and Girl Scouts, and fellow citizens in reliving the fateful day of April 19th, 1775, that thrust the colonies into the start of the American Revolution. Uh, it is Patriots Day, Monday, April 15th. Step off is at 4 a.m. from the Chelmsford Common, and it ends at Minutemen National Park. And um, for more information, you can contact Captain John Greenwood at 6middlesex at gmail.com or... Um, Sergeant Jim Curley at jcurley12 at comcast.net. Just one note about that that event. <coughs> it's it's a been a tradition that newly elected members of this board, <laughs> newly, <laughs> mem newly elected members of this board participate their first year. So we'll see you there next Monday. <laughs> four a.m. Four a.m. sharp. Maybe. Sharp. Four a.m. Yeah. You can continue. Thank you. Um, the Chelmsford Health Departments would like to announce their free program, Creative Connections. Um, it's for parents and guardians to bridge the communication gap with your child. Um, it's a free art session where they will create captivating collages together. It is for middle school aged youth and their parent or guardian and runs April 2nd or April 16th from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. at the Chelmsford Center for the Arts and registration is Required. If you have questions, you can call the Chelmsford Health Department. Um, and next, we have a another announcement from the Chelmsford Health Department for free youth mental health first aid training. Um, the youth mental health first aid training teaches adults how to identify, understand, and respond to signs of mental health and substance use challenges among children and adolescents from ages 12 to 18. It is April 18th from 9 to 3 at the Chelmsford Town Hall Fire Training Room. And for questions, you can contact Taryn Angel at 978-250-5241. The next announcement is for 2024 Earth Week, the town-wide cleanup. Um, Earth Day is Monday, April 22nd, but we will be celebrating all year. You can plan your cleanup for the week of the 15th through the 21st, and yellow bags can be picked up at the DPW at 9 Alpha Road anytime from the 8th to the 19th during regular hours. If you have questions, you can reach out to the sustainability manager uh, at 978-250-5203. And the last announcement I have is uh, for spring annual town meeting. Spring Annual Town Meeting will be Monday, April 29th at 7.30 p.m. at the Senior Center at 75 Groton Road. It will convene at 7.30 p.m. Um, a copy of the warrant is available now on the town's website, 
and any resident of the town who is not an elected town meeting member may attend sessions of the town meeting and participate in questions and answer and discussion portions of the proceedings. Links to the town meeting presentation document and the finance committee's warrant book will be found on the town meeting webpage one week prior to town meeting. And that's all I have. Okay, thank you. All right, next up is public input. If there's anybody here that would like to address the board about any topic, you're free to do that at this, at this time. Uh, I'd like to note that if you're here about the 40B at um, 243 Riverneck Road, we do have a public hearing schedule for that, and you will have an opportunity at that time to speak. So if there is anybody who wants to speak about anything else, now is your opportunity. Anyone? There's no one in the Zoom room. Speak. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to committee vacancies. Committee vacancies, uh, we have a one vacancy for the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee, a three-year term ending June 30th, 2026. The Board of Appeals has a one-year term open for an associate member. The Conservation Commission has one unexpired three-year term ending June 30th, 2025. The Commission on Disabilities has two unexpired three-year terms. The Community Action Program Committee has one unexpired three-year term. The Cultural Council has one three-year term open. The Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee has one three-year term. The Historic District Commission has one unexpired three-year term for an associate member. The Holiday Decorating Committee has three unexpired one-year terms. The Parade Committee, all applicants are welcome. Those are one-year terms. The Public Records Advisory Committee has one unexpired one-year term open. The Roberts Field Advisory Committee has two terms open. The Recycling Committee has one unexpired three-year term open. Uh, in addition, the town moderator is seeking a candidate to fill an unexpired term on the Finance Committee expiring on June 30th, 2026. If you are interested in serving on a town board or committee, please complete an online application available on the town website or contact the town manager's office for more information. Okay, thank you. Okay, next is uh, we have a couple licenses this evening. First up is um, uh, an application from the Old Mill House for an entertainment license. Is there anybody here representing the Old Mill House? Do you want to come up to the microphone? Okay, and if you could identify yourself and tell us what you want to do. Sure. Um, my name is Kristen Hunt, and I'm the events coordinator for Old Mahouse Coffee. Um, yearly, we run several artisan markets um, on our property right behind the shop, and we are just hoping to add a little bit of acoustic music to our markets um, between 11 and 4 on Saturdays. Um, mm -hmm. we, we run currently seven markets a year, and uh, it seems to be a lot of fun, but that's kind of our, our goal, not adding any stage or anything it's just going to be on the ground a few a guitar and a singer or something similar to that not too loud no electricity involved or anything like that okay so so no uh just on those seven days that you have an event or regular yeah Saturdays just on the no just on the days that oh. we have events yep. okay all right anybody else have any questions for Kristen? um Paul, I don't, I don't know if it matters. The on page two where the signature is, they didn't date it, so I don't know if that needs to happen. That's um, the building commissioner made a comment about the parking and mm -hmm. deconflicting with the other businesses there. Yes. What's the status of that? So um, I talked with his concern was the parking for navigation in that back parking lot, and I did talk with um, Mr. Negron and. Uh, P.J. Mercer, who's the owner at Navigation, and with the landlord from the whole strip. And we, it doesn't have to be in those specific spaces. P.J. is completely fine with it. He's not planning to use those spaces on our market days. Um, same thing with the landlord, Bobby. He's completely fine with it. They're excited because they're kind of doing the markets with us. But if it becomes a problem at any point, we're willing to move the, mar the space because, again, it's very flexible, very easy. It's not building up anything. We can move it back onto one of our parking spaces or in one of our vendor spaces for the day. Okay, and I think you just answered my second okay. question. By Bobby, you mean the landowner? Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, Bobby I, I didn't know if there was any further coordination or approval that was needed from, with him. from him. Oh, but no. It sounds like you're all set. Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, anything else? All right. 
You ready to make a motion? Sure. I will make a motion to approve the entertainment license for Old Millhouse Coffee LLC at 24 Central Square as presented. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you. We'll see Good you luck. next time. <coughs> okay. Um, next up, we have a one day um, beer and wine license. For um, at, to be exercised at St. Uh, St. John's Church, I believe, is where the location is. Yeah, George Foyoung is on the Zoom call. Okay. Just being remotely. George, if you can turn your camera on and unmute yourself. There he is. Okay. Hi, good evening, members. Uh, my name is George Foyoung. Uh, uh, my son is graduating from... Uh, college on the, uh, May 11th, and we are planning a graduation party for him at the St. John's Hall that same day from uh, uh, 5 p.m. to 11 uh, p.m. that night. So we, we, we have applied to get uh, a one-day beer and wine license to dispense alcohol to our guest for the night. Okay, um, anybody have any questions about this application? Okay, if not, we can take another motion. I'll make a motion to approve the one-day beer and wine license for George Foyoung, 115 Middlesex Street for May 11th, 2024, as presented. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you, George. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Congratulations to your son. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Bye. <laughs> Okay, we are at the point for the um, public hearing for the uh, proposed local initiative project at uh, 243 Riverneck Road. Um, now I'm, I'm expecting that there's a ap uh, representatives from the applicant here. Okay, so the way that I'd like to run this is we'll have them make their presentation. Um, I will then go through the uh, re uh, reports we have gotten from the department heads and several emails we have received, at which point then I will open it up for public comment. So, go ahead. Good evening, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board. I'm Adam Costa for the record with the firm of Mead, Tallerman and Costa uh, with an office in Newburyport uh, here this evening on behalf of 243 Riverneck LLC and Ashok Patel, its manager. Uh, as you indicated, this is a proposal for a lip endorsement by the board. We submitted an application about a month ago uh, pursuant to your uh, lip policy and procedures. Um, what I'd like to do, if you'll uh, indulge me, is just provide a brief overview of the project. We have multiple members of our project team present tonight. Uh, we also have our 40B consultant, Dean Harrison, who I believe is available by Zoom as well. But we have our engineers and our architects in the house. Um, I'm not going to go through a detailed uh, description, unless you want me to, uh, of all the various plans that we've submitted. We've submitted um, uh, engineered site plans, we've submitted a survey plan, we've submitted architecturals, renderings, uh, floor plan, elevations, qu qu quite a bit uh, for this early stage in the process, but we wanted to provide the board with a, a general overview of the, the proposal. Again, I have those present. I have them on, on uh, large-scale format plans that I can place on an easel. Um, they're also, I see on the screen as well, at least in part, we have some updated rendering. So I'm happy to go through all of that in as much detail as the board was li would like, but I'll just provide a general overview initially as to what the that project's all good. about. Yeah. Sure. So uh, this property, and, and some of you may be familiar with it, either from personal experience or um, just through word of mouth, this is a property that was permitted for Chapter 40B affordable housing development back in 2003. Uh, Princeton Properties was the applicant at that time. We're, not, we're all unaffiliated with Princeton, and I don't represent Princeton. Uh, same property owner at the time had entered into an agreement to gain site control back in 2002, made application uh, to the town. In 2003, a comprehensive permit was issued by the town zoning board of appeals. Uh, that project was a much more dense project than what you see here. That was a proposal for uh, 48 units of housing, 25% uh, of which would have been um, would have been affordable. Uh, that project obviously never got con constructed. The comprehensive permit was extended multiple times, um, in some instances by operation of law, uh, and in other instances by extensions granted by the Zoning Board of Appeals. And in fact, that permit is still in effect 
But again, the holder of that permit is Princeton Properties, and Princeton Properties no longer has control of the site. Their, their uh, purchase and sale agreement with the property owner expired long ago. Uh, so my client, uh, Ashok Patel, and the, the uh, single purpose LLC has created, um, is proposing the, the project that you see on the site. And this is a, a combination, uh, and it's a bit unique to the 40B world. I've seen a few done in this manner. Uh, combination ownership and rental. So you'll see at the rear of the site, we have a proposal for six single family homes. These are uh, four bedroom single family homes. Of those six fam uh, single family homes, two would be deemed affordable uh, in perpetuity. Um, that is higher than 25%, um, but of course, when you have an uneven number of total units, we have 23 here in total, uh, you've got to round up in terms of the number of affordable units you provide uh, in the project. So we're providing two, we're proposing to provide two of those six single family homes as affordable units. Um, as I mentioned, total number of units on the site is 26, so that means that there are uh, 17 uh, additional units you can see at the front of the site. These are rental units. They're townhouse-style rental units. Um, they will be two-bedroom units, uh, but there is a, uh, an inconsistency that I think maybe your DPW or your community development director had identified in the, in the reports uh, to the board, and that is that we had re referred to these in one instance as two-bedroom units, and elsewhere in our materials we referred to the possibility of a three-bedroom unit. The reason for that is back in, I want to say, 2014 or 15, uh, what was then the, the Department of Housing and Community Development, it's now the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities, adopted a policy uh, requiring three-bedroom units in all Chapter 40B projects. The, the proposal was to avoid uh, what many developers were doing, which is proposing uh, projects comprising simply of single and, and, and two bedroom units in an effort to uh, avoid the concern that is sometimes raised by municipalities that when you get th three or four bedroom units you bring school children to the to the community and that results in increased education costs uh, the state determined that that wasn't permissible and they've now required that all projects have a minimum 10 percent uh, three bedroom units and that's done by um, by housing style and so we are proposing that um, of the uh, 17 units. Uh, two of those units would be uh, three bedroom units to meet that to meet that requirement of the state the state policy. Um, you'll see we're proposing uh, a, a single driveway slash roadway. I'm not sure exactly how to refer to it. I saw again some of the comments from departments had spoken about a roadway. It's really more of a driveway that'll be providing access uh, first to the parking area for the townhouse style units and then to the single family homes. It certainly won't be a roadway that would meet your subdivision standards, but of course that's sort of the nature of, of Chapter 40B that there can be waivers requested. But I'm also not certain that we would be seeking to, again, qualify this as a roadway per se but rather as a, a driveway providing um, access to those to those uh, single-family homes at the rear of the site. Um, I, I know, uh, Madam Chair, you mentioned that you're going to uh, speak to the various comments, and I'm not going to go through each of the letters. I think there were eight of them that you received from uh, various departments or, or officials of the town, but I, I want to highlight uh, a couple of things that is worth noting um, now, and certainly we can respond in further detail if the board members have questions. Uh, so the first is, um, there were some comments relating to uh, sewer moratorium. So there's obviously, in this case, um, no proposal uh, that has been made for an on-site uh, sewage disposal system, um, a, a treatment plant. Um, that is purposeful. This is a relatively small project. Uh, to be candid, even, even the original 48-unit project that was approved back in 2003 would not have justified economically uh, a sewage treatment plant. So um, we had a reserved capacity back in 2003 when this project was originally approved. Uh, we would be seeking similar capacity for this particular project. We would need a waiver for, um, from that moratorium requirement. Uh, we, we've included that in the proposed waiver list that we've submitted. Uh, I did have uh, some back and forth um, with your town manager and with your council maybe six or eight months ago, maybe more than that, 10, 12 months ago, when we began initially conceptually looking at this site uh, on the question of whether or not that reserve capacity was tied to the site or tied to the original permit that issued to Princeton Properties. And there was sort of a lack of clarity there as to which of the two things it was tied to. So I suppose we could make an argument that we're entitled to that capacity because it was locked in back in 2003. But I'm also not sure we need to make the argument because if this is a project that the board supports and we move forward as a local initiative program project, a friendly 40B, then we would seek a waiver from the Zoning Board of Appeals as part of the traditional Chapter 40B uh, uh, process. 
And the same goes for the moratorium with respect to road openings. My understanding is that this roadway was um, was rebuilt or repaved um, just a couple of years ago. So there's a five year moratorium. Uh, we would need a waiver from that moratorium depending upon when construction begins. I think I want to say it runs through 2026 or 27. It's referenced in one of the letters that was received. So to the extent that construction begins before that date, we need a waiver. Uh, and obviously, we'd expect that if the uh, Zoning Board of Appeals were prepared to issue such a waiver, that they would condition it appropriately requiring us likely to restore whatever portion of the roadway we disturb uh, to a condition similar to the condition that it's in today uh, as opposed to sort of the, the the patchwork that sometimes results from projects like this um, so that's one point that I wanted to raise a second point and it's it's a fair one uh, is something that was raised by uh, mr. Blansky and in fact it was a conversation as well that I had with David Hedison uh, uh, the the chair or director of the Chelmsford Housing Authority uh, and that relates to the added benefit of this project being proposed as a lip project as opposed to this project being proposed consistent with the traditional 40b route so I suspect board members are, are aware of the difference so when an applicant wishes to pursue a chapter 40b affordable housing project they have two options they can go the traditional 40b route all that means is application is made to a state subsidy it's usually mass housing once the state subsidy issues a determination of eligibility the applicant then goes before the zoning board of appeals and the community seeking a comprehensive permit and then later seeks final approval the difference with the lip program or, or lip projects is that a lip project requires this initial appearance before the select board or the chief executive officials of the community and asks the select board to endorse the project and provide support the subsidy then rather than it being mass housing is a direct state sub subsidy it's through the executive office of housing and livable <laughs> communities uh, typically boards like yours will ask of the applicant well what are you offering us if we're offering you our endorsement what what added benefit do we get by you going through this local initiative program process as opposed to the more traditional 40b process and so uh, we're offering uh, things that are twofold and in fact uh, there's a reference again an inconsistency so to speak that was referenced by uh, one of your uh, one of your departments but it actually isn't an inconsistency at all um, I've mentioned before that we would be offering six total units as affordable that's a requirement 25 percent um, if the number is fractional you have to round up so we have 23 units that means it's just under six total units would be required to be affordable rounding up that's six units and we initially proposed two of the single-family homes uh, and four of the the townhouses which is required as well that they be interdispersed throughout the the, the different aspects of the the project uh, what we're offering uh, through the lip process is we would offer an additional two affordable units as part of that rental development uh, part of the uh, the, the townhouse um, so we'd have a total of six affordable units in, in the front portion of the property uh, plus the two affordable single-family homes for a total of eight affordable units what we'd also be willing to do is provide a greater extent of affordability with respect to those uh, six rental units that are townhouses so as you know the minimum standard to qualify under the chapter 40b program is 80 percent area median income with a window of 70 to 80 percent we'd be prepared to offer um, three of those six units in the uh, townhouses at 70 percent and three of those six units at 60 percent so that makes them uh, it provides a greater window of affordability for individuals to qualify for those units which has been a problem in many communities where the 70 to 80 percent standard still isn't quite affordable enough uh, for many individuals that we would consider to, to otherwise need affordable housing um, it, it economically it can be a challenge for developers to to provide housing at that lower lower percentage of AMI, uh, but we've run the numbers and we think that we can we can accommodate that um, what on AMI this project. Do, what AMI do you anticipate for the additional two units above the six? Uh, so we'd have um, they're, they're uh, eighty percent, seventy eighty percent for the single family homes. So the two that are the two affordable units that are uh, in the rear portion of the site that comprise uh, the single family homes would be at the traditional 40B standard. Um, and, and that's, we tried to work the numbers, I will tell you, to make it uh, work, allowing us to even drop the AMI for those single family homes. The challenge with ownership projects and Dean Harrison can probably speak to this better than I can. I'm not a numbers guy. I'm, I'm the attorney, not the not the financial consultant. But uh, my understanding, and it's consistent with my experience with other projects, is with ownership projects, it costs developers far more to actually build the affordable units than they can recoup in terms of sales price, often twice as much to build the unit as they recoup in sales price. So for those single family homes, we're already providing essentially a, a third of the, of the total six units 
um, as as, uh, as excuse me seven units as affordable uh, units, and so that that is is a challenge because. Uh, the numbers simply don't work. We begin to either add an additional affordable unit to the single family homes uh, or we, we drop the percentage AMI and it just throws the numbers out of whack and doesn't really work for us. Um, again, Dean can likely speak to that if you have further questions more eloquently uh, than I can. So we've submitted, um, as you saw, a fairly comprehensive narrative. We tried to, um, to mirror the requirements that are in your policies and procedures. So we've uh, provided a summary of the plans that we've uh, supplied. We provided a project narrative, which I've just summarized generally for you. You'll see in the project narrative um, the proposed uh, sales prices for the affordables as well as the proposed monthly rent for the affordables. Uh, we also have identified the setbacks that we're proposing for the site. We do require a bit of dimensional relief uh, for the project, although it's not significant in the, in the uh, 40B context. Um, we've addressed... Uh, Things like community benefit, we've again referred to and incorporated and provided a full copy of the pro forma uh, that we've have done. It's actually two pro formas, one for uh, the uh, home ownership component of the project and one for the rental component of the project. And then, of course, we have uh, our additional plans and, and renderings, and we're happy to walk through those in as much or as little detail as the board would like. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I guess um, you know, go, continuing on in, in the, uh, the narrative that, that you um, that you included, uh, talking about the different I aspects that we look for in our in our policy. Could you talk a little bit more about the community outreach that you've done? Sure. So is Ashok here? Ah, do you want to speak about community outreach and communications you've had? Sorry, I didn't see you at the back of the room. Oh, that's fine. Thanks. Uh, Ashok Patel, uh, representing the project. So we've, we've Ashok Patel, representing the project. The, the community outreach piece, um, we have uh, not had a great success yet. Uh, I know we've had our, our agents drop off some letters today, actually. I do plan to continue to have uh, dialogue with the neighbors to figure out their concern as to what we can make better. Um, we were planning to do this on Sunday, actually. Um, but then the weather got a little bit uh, wacky, so we couldn't do it. Before that month, I was traveling. I wasn't in town, so I think that kind of messed up my schedule itself. But we will continue to make the efforts with all the neighbors who are impacted immediately um, on, this, on this site to try and explain how this project is a lot less denser than what it was before in terms of the 48 units, 96 rooms, uh, 96 bedrooms approved before, so. In, in the narrative in your proposal where you're mapping against our LIP policy and you map against set policy section 6.2-3, which is um, the community engagement, you, you assert that you've engaged with the community. So was that, when was that? Was that during the previous proposal? It, 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 it was wasn't recently, right? No, that, that's correct. So that was during the previous proposal, and then there's a reference here, and again, this was the intention to occur between the submittal of the application and tonight. The dis discussions of specific project characteristics and attributes will continue up to and beyond the board's meeting on the LIP proposal. So we had It's on page three of their application. That's correct. So we had intended to certainly have further conversations with neighbors. Now, as you probably know, there is a, a lengthy history of development of this site. Um, there were issues with respect to neighbors. There were issues with respect to uh, your conservation commission. I saw the letter from the conservation agent indicating that, um, or reminding the board that uh, back in 2002 or 2000, early 2003, uh, that there had been multiple requests for uh, orders of conditions that had been denied locally, and then ultimately the state had issued uh, superseding orders for the project. You know, we tried in developing this iteration of uh, project for the site to be more sensitive to environmental areas, um, as you probably see. And in fact, the, the site plan doesn't capture it in its in its totality. Uh, there's a substantial portion of the site. I want to say it's upwards of five acres. Is that right? right? upwards of five acres at the rear of the site that is uh, not being developed. There could be an attempt to develop it. Um, we, we had looked at that in, in considering options for the site. That uh, would require a wetlands crossing to gain access to some limited upland there. Um, but knowing the issues that had arisen previously, um, again, only secondhand because we weren't personally involved, uh, we decided to simply determine that we were not going to cross over that boundary um, between, essentially between the, the, the portion of the property that is zoned, I want to say industrial versus uh, residential. Okay. 
I just have a quick um, clarification question. You mentioned six four-bedroom units and 17 townhouses earlier in your presentation, and I'm seeing in your <laughs> documentation that there's seven four-bedroom houses, single-family houses, and 16 townhouses. Yeah, I, I, what I is messed, it? I messed up my math. Okay. <laughs> so I, I, so I, is it as we I, see I transposed it? my six and my seven. So there's seven single-family homes and 16 townhouses. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so if you're, if you're uh, completed with your presentation, I'll go through the, the uh, re um, feedback that we received from the department heads sure. and then see if whatever, qu whatever other comments we have and questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we did receive a, a letter from uh, the DPW, and they said uh, uh, a full site plan review has not been conducted, so they reserve the right to, uh, to do that, and to, especially to review the stormwater management conditions. Uh, note that the, there needs to be an enclosed dumpster and dumpster and dumpster, uh, dumpster pad and dumpster upon the, uh, the site with the, the plan and a plan for perpetual care of the dumpster, including the emptying, which is responsibility of the property owner. Um, all existing and proposed utilities need to be marked on the plans. Um, they note, as, uh, as Mr. Costa has said, that this section of Riverneck Road was paved in 2022 and the five-year moratorium will run until 2027. Uh, they need to provide a snow storage location on the site plan. Uh, they noted that no pedestrian accommodation was considered on the application. Um, <clears throat> they note that um, overflow discharge from proposed underground uh, chambers um, could discharge directly onto a neighboring property. Uh, they note a pump station and generator are located within, fif within 50 feet of the no-build wetland zoning area. They want a confirmation of the residential stormwater infrastructure, and that also should be included in the stormwater report. And has been noted about sewer capacity. Um, they note that uh, there is 500 gallons per day allowed on the site right now, and anything greater than that, so anything, they estimate 6,100 gallons per day would have to be um, treated either on site or uh, either with a septic tank or a wastewater treatment plant. Um, then a proposed sewer, uh, sewer infrastructure has not been reviewed for the, for the capacity that's proposed here, and they have concerns about the uh, sewer capacity in this general location. The police department notes that this uh, needs to be a, sh a stop sign at the end of the driveway at the intersection of Riverneck Road. The uh, fire department uh, has requested a water flow test near the site. Um, calculations to be submitted to the department. They note that hydrants must maintain a 10-foot clearance radius from any obstruction or parking spaces. Uh, comprehensive fire apparatus access and man maneuvering plan must be submitted um, at some point. Uh, snow storage must not hinder or block fire access roads or turnarounds. The townhouse units shall be equipped with a monitored automatic sprinkler system according to fire standards. The placement of fire protection equipment is subject to approval from the fire department. <laughs> Residences must have fire alarms that meet current standards. And as far as street naming and addressing, uh, the fire chief uh, does uh, require you to propose three uh, potential names for the roadway, and the applicant has to submit to the uh, Town of Chancellor D-9 on one committee for addresses. The Board of Health notes you have to meet the expectations of the general provisions of um, the groundwater protection zone. Um, if, an on, if there is an on-site septic system proposed, it must meet all Title V regulations. And uh, as was noted earlier both from the DPW, uh, dumpster and dumpster pad must meet the Board of Health uh, commercial refuse dumpster collection licensing and operate, operating regulations. Uh, building commissioner notes that you, be, uh, you will, will be required to meet all current building codes to include the current energy code and <clears throat> that he will be um, enforcing the dimensional requirements as per Chapter 195 of the Town Bylaws, unless you get any waivers, obviously. And then uh, Community Development Director, you've mentioned uh, several of his comments already about the uh, affordable units uh, and what level of AMI they would be required, uh, the inhabitants would be required to, to meet. They also, he also notes <coughs> that the Greater Lowell Habitat for Humanity has been seeking a project in Chelmsford, <coughs> and this might be one that you might consider 
uh, partnering with them. <clears throat> he notes that the narrative indicates that two townhouses that'll be two bedrooms, um, but then it appears that you have two and three bedroom, as you mentioned, so you have clarified that. Uh, he, he notes that you have a four bedroom single family dwelling with, with which each have a two car garage and a driveway. Confirmation should be provided that each driveway can also accommodate two cars. Uh, he notes that the proposal appears to lack adequate visitor parking and a preliminary cut and fill analysis should be provided. Um, one of the sheets shows the location for the affordable uh, units and this should be clarified as to where they should be and they are required to be distributed rather than concentrated. You have mentioned that you're aware of that. And he also mentioned the sewer system. Um, notes that a waiver at this point um, seems to be premature. A request for a waiver at this point seems to be premature. And he asked what is proposed for the remainder of the site, uh, which I assume that at some point we'll find that out. Um, Conservation Commission notes that, as you mentioned, that uh, uh, this site was uh, previously denied um, uh, a 40, the approval of a 40B project. Um, and then when it, it, and then nothing has happened since since it was approved after it was sent back to the Conservation Commission and ZBA. We also did receive several um, several emails, um, some of which uh, relate to the uh, have issues with um, the proximity to the um, public water supply. Uh, worried about accidents that could cause hazardous materials to go into the the water supply, and let's see, I don't have others. Did you uh, touch upon the comment from the Chelmsford Water District? I just got to, yeah, I don't know why I missed that one. Yeah, the Chelmsford Water District notes that the property is in the Zone 2 aquifer protection, and you'll need to uh, follow groundwater protection statement, standard operating procedures. Um, and then what, uh, one resident um, sent an email concerned about the development size, noting that this will, would likely cause an increase of 65% uh, increase in traffic uh, in this area of uh, Riverneck Road, concerned about the impact on, on wetlands and multiple animal species that live in that area. Um, this person uh, is in a butter and is concerned about significant drops off, drop offs around the property and how it's gonna affect his, his property. Um, questions about the uh, infiltration of stormwater, and that's been raised several times by other departments. Um, again, uh, uh, rare, rare species uh, uh, noted on eight areas of the property, um, directly about zone one, extensive wetlands on the site. Um, questions about the accuracy of identifying the wetlands. I think that's about a, a recap of everything that we have received to date. Um, if anybody else on the board has any questions, we can go to those questions first, and then we'll open it up to the um, to the public. Just note this is still a, a public hearing, so we shouldn't be making any determinations at this point. Just if you have any clarification questions, we can ask those at this point. George, anything? Um, I'd like to ask Mr. Havity a question. Sure. Paul, the 40B that was um, approved at one time, and now it's kind of up in the air. If somebody were to take, if one of the two owners, the, either the current owner or, uh, in other words, if, if somebody were to get that back into play, is that, is that, uh, is that a possibility is what I'm asking you? <clears throat> uh, certainly, so it's possible that it could still be in play in the sense that the comprehensive permit has not yet expired by its terms. Um, it would require the holder of the comprehensive permit to work cooperatively with the current owner of the property, which has historically not been the case. Um, so I, I can't rule it out entirely, um, but it seems unlikely. And if it were, if it were, what would, how many units would there be on that? Forty. I believe it was forty-eight. Forty-eight. Yes. And what does, what, how would the, the sewer be affected? Would the original uh, approval, would it go back to the original approval of the 40B? Yeah, so the units that as originally approved would have qualified for the um, 
the grandfathering status under the sewer moratorium. But that wouldn't carry over unless there was some kind of agreement between the previous applicant and this one? It, so we had a discussion, um, as Attorney Coster had mentioned, that, that we, we went over this question, and ultimately we determined that it was a question that should be addressed as part of the comprehensive permit process in front of the Board of Appeals if they ever got there. We reviewed the sewer moratorium. I don't think it's clear whether or not it's project-specific uh, specific or whether it's site-specific, um, but ultimately we said that it would make more sense to just deal with this as part of any comprehensive <coughs> permit. So well, it, I mean, the concern I have with that is that we're making an endorsement or a non-endorsement recommendation. Yep. And I mean, this board spent the better part of a year with Paul working the sewer issue. So I don't, is there something that can be done to help us help inform our decision as to whether or not it's even feasible? Well, that's a separate question. Um, obviously, from the time that the sewer moratorium went into effect, there have been additional connections. There has been additional capacity. We continue to see. Well, we're at we're at or over typically. I was going to say right we now. we continue to see sewer flows. You know that are beyond, well, you know what they should be under the agreements. Um, so that's that is a question that ultimately would have to be determined by the board of appeals as part of any application for a comprehensive permit because the board of appeals under chapter 40b serves as all local permit granting authorities. So they would essentially be the sewer division of the DPW as it relates to that project. So they could either determine that there is not sufficient capacity to allow a waiver to be granted, or they could determine that there is sufficient capacity and allow a waiver to be granted. It, it's uh, ultimately... And they would work... They, they would the, absolutely work the with the sewer... DPW would inform, help yes. inform their decision? Correct. So I just want to follow up a little bit on on, uh, on our responsibilities versus the ZBA. Nothing we do is going to change anything that the ZBA is going to do, correct? Absolutely correct, yes. Okay. So the process that's in front of you now is a request for a LIP endorsement. Um, and as Attorney Coster noted, it's one of two different ways in which an applicant mm -hmm. can proceed under Chapter 40B. If you deny a LIP endorsement um, as requested, they can still go to Mass Housing, MHP, or another funding agency and request that they get a project eligibility letter for them, take that to the Board of Appeals, file a comprehensive permit application, and they're ultimately in the same position as they would have been if you had granted a LIP endorsement. Granting a LIP endorsement does not place any restrictions on the Board of Appeals. Um, they have, you know, whatever rights that they have to either deny or approve a development. It doesn't matter that, you know, you endorsed it as a LIP. It can still be denied if, the, you know, the board determines that there are legitimate issues of local concern that outweigh the regional need for affordable housing. And we don't have any authority to issue a waiver, is that correct? No, only the Board of Appeals would have authority okay. to issue waivers. Okay. Anyone did you have? Yeah, can I ask a question? So the, the comprehensive permit, um, and I think this was, I am familiar with this uh, from the CBA, but the comprehensive permit, how, how long, because I know that this, this one has been extended several times. Twice? Can Five you tell times. me? I, two or three times, but there's, there was also the COVID extensions that yeah. were by law. It didn't require the Board of Appeals to take any action. Um, so that's why they're currently still a valid permit. And when does this one expire? I, Adam, do you know? Because I think it was just redone a couple of years ago. It, it was just it, extended. I, my, my recollection is it's later this year. I want to say September. It does expire this year, September. C correct. Um, correct. So then... In the Board of Appeals, leaving aside the potential for cooperation between this applicant and the former holder of the comprehensive permit, um, they, they wouldn't be able, they wouldn't be in a position to request an additional extension mm -hmm. because they don't hold that comprehensive permit anymore. Interesting. Right. Pat, anything? No. Okay. I, I don't have questions. I just have some comments and concerns. I don't know if you want me to hold that or... Yeah, why don't we wait till we hear from the public and then we can kind of wrap them all up and see where we go from here. Okay, thank okay. you. 
Okay, so uh, members of the public, you can now come up to the microphone and please um, identify yourself. And um, I, I'd ask other members if somebody ahead of you has covered the topic that you wanted to talk about to keep your comments brief. You can just say, yeah, I agree with that person. Um, we, we don't know if we're going to finish this hearing this evening. Um, I think it's very likely that we will not. So um, anyway, so we'll, we will go ahead. Okay. But, my name is Ruth Luna, 10 Carter Drive, Precinct 10 Rep. Um, I was on the Conservation Commission both times in 2005 and 2006 when this um, 40B was um, denied by the Commission. I wrote the findings for the second denial. Um, and then Joel here was on the ZBA when it was remanded to the ZBA for a limited scope. Um, so I just wanted to just quickly say that in the 2000s, it was a contentious ZBA process. Um, additionally, I was on the um, Affordable Housing Plan Committee, and this site was not identified by the town as being a suitable site for a 40B project. It's identified now after it had already been permitted as one, and so obviously you're not going to leave off what you already have there. Um, I've gone through the older records for this file before the 2000s and found um, interesting information from the late 1990s as far as that there had been um, disputes over whether one could make two or three buildable lots out of this whole site. And um, the, it was cited as the, that there were a lot of challenges with, due to the topography and the soil on this site making it questionable whether you could get three, three lots out of it and citing steep slope ledge. And then when 495 was built, too much was excavated such that there are points that are excavated down into the groundwater and then that apparently materials were left behind on the site that were, they said at the time, unsuitable for septic. But an important point to consider is then does it also make it unsuitable for infiltration, which the stormwater relies on. Um, so I just wanted to raise those questions. Um, and they also said that the development of the site beyond that was um, not something that they thought could be done. The site um, is environmentally sensitive in terms of where two of the people along with another person here who tracked the radio track the rare species as far as there's two types of turtles here. The applicant has not noted that the, the existing filing that he references for the 40B has on it a 6.6 .6 acre conservation restriction which um, would preclude the use of that area and there would actually be a fence running around everything but river nick road a five link chain link five foot chain link fence that goes around the entire property with turtle gates along the two wetland sides so basically this area was all to be fenced in to be protected from the turtles and anything that is proposed here on this part or the lower part has to go through natural heritage the state agency tasked with protecting rare species um, they additionally don't identify that zone one directly abuts their property. Um, and on their existing condition plans, there are some changes there that need to be made as far as they have their contours incorrectly labeled. They don't even show it going over as far as they propose to do building. Um, and there's some changes on it when you compare it with the plans that were approved uh, for an ORAD by the Conservation Commission in the early 2000s although no work should have been done without a CR being executed. Um, and there's questions about the wetland line, both around the, the one large wetland to the north. Um, but additionally, um, in going through the old records, I found old wetland maps that show that presumably as a result of the excavation, what looks to be two isolated wetlands potentially are, have been created on this site. They were identified on those, pla on those plans. And if those are, in fact, isolated wetlands, then you have two houses that are sitting on isolated wetlands. Those are a protected resource area under the local bylaw. They have their own buffer zone as well. So the, the wetland lines definitely need to be checked both for the overall, the BBWs, as well as for isolated wetlands. And I would recommend the commission be consulted on that, the, I was told by DEP that the superseding order they issued has expired. So they would still need to deal with the Conservation Commission, whatever the situation is. The main concerns the commission had 
were the impacts to the wetland from all the clearing and all the work being proposed and as far as the stormwater management that was proposed. And um, so those would still carry over now even with a lower density. Um, as far as the stormwater management, um, there, as I said, from the cited from the 1990s, and the commission felt at the time in the 2000s, much more testing has to be done on this site because it's not clear that what is proposed can even work. You can't site infiltration on fill. It's not clear that they have the needed separation from groundwater. So that kind of testing, DEP tells pe applicants to do that before they do plans to have made sure that what they propose can work. So that absolutely needs to be done beforehand, not after the fact, because they've already before said for this site that it's too hard to do septic. Um, so I would definitely not want that. And the water district, the commission before had asked for a hydrogeo study for the water district, and that should be done before a permit as well. And then I just wanted to add as far as the effective density, they talked about the overall density as being 2.44. But your um, policies say that they should also address effective density. So if you assume the CR that was in effect, or the heritage, natural heritage called for before, that bumps you up to an effective density of 8.2 units per acre, which would make it slightly greater than what the town has for the multifamily district. And then you have a side yard setback. Um, they have up to down to 9.5 feet. For an RB, which this is in, it would be 25 feet. When you have multifamily within an RB, it's supposed to be 45 feet. <coughs> so I just wanted to add those points. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Is there anyone else that would like to make any comments at this time? Hi, my name is Steve Karopoulos. Um, we're a uh, resident of Forest Street, a long-term uh, resident, almost 70 years. Um, I c the beautiful map, I just can't see exactly where their driveway is coming out in correlation to Forest Street. Um, my parents are still living there. They're in their 90s. They do not want the additional traffic. Um, they resisted the truck company going down the street. They resisted the first project. I grew up there and I played on this land. It was originally the Piro's land. Um, there's one home situated on it in the only I consider buildable, and I'm a former contractor, site contractor, uh, only buildable portion. I don't see how they can build in wetlands and lowlands. In New Hampshire, our rules aren't as strict as yours in Massachusetts. That's lowlands. I've witnessed several floodings of that area in my time living there. Um, the final thing I wanted to say is, uh, I don't know, you date back to 1990s on information on some of the land. Um, when the Piros passed away, Mr. Piro had 30 to 40 junk cars in the back, parts cars. He was a mechanic of sorts. And fa their family ended up cleaning that all out. But I would like to see maybe somebody test that land because I know when you have that many vehicles, r radiator fluid, oil, brake fluid, leaks, you just can't get away from that. And if even that land is somewhat contaminated. I don't know how they're going to build this. Really, unless you fill the wetlands in or fill the lowlands. I don't want to call it wetlands because I don't know specifically was designated. Um, I, I can't see the picture of the driveway. There's only one lot there that's road level. The rest of it, a drop, a massive drop. I don't know where the stream is located on the map on here. I used to fish in that stream right in that location because we used to cut across the street go through the woods, because Mr. Piro let us go down that little driveway of his and go fishing down there. I just, I just can't see it. I just can't see the location. All the other stuff the conservation people said, yeah, well, I mean, we have this problem up in New Hampshire. They didn't want me to put a driveway in because of a spotted salamander. 
and I had to fight that because the spotted salamander is not endangered. So uh, this is, I mean, I just can't see it. We originally thought one house, like they said, two houses maybe. But when they went into this multiple families thing, uh, the traffic alone just on Riverneck Road, uh, I don't see how Riverneck Road would handle it. Um, the intersection of 129 and, and Riverneck Road is already disastrous. Uh, as a youth, I used to be able to ride my bicycle to Chelmsford to the friendlies in, in the library. I wouldn't send my kid down that road now with the traffic. And this would just increase. That's all it would be, is increasing the traffic. I don't know if it would impact the value of our homes. Like I said, we've owned the place quite a long time. We found out from our neighbor's sales that now our home's worth a lot of money. I don't want that disappearing on me. I mean, we're getting all older here, and uh, I don't want that. I don't want that. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Chris Lavalley, 10 Edgewood Street, Town Meeting uh, Rep, Precinct 10. Um, I live not that far away from there, and that is my precinct. Um, I moved to town about 12 years ago now, um, so I wasn't around for the first uh, 40B projects that were proposed in that, that area, uh, but I've heard about them. <coughs> and every time I drive by that property, I look down and see how much water is down there. I looked actually on my way over here tonight, and that is a huge pond down there right now. Um, I'm a big advocate of affordable housing. I think we need more in Massachusetts, but I'm appalled at the location that they're actually trying to put affordable housing down there. Um, it's, not a, it's not a livable area. Uh, it's not a place that I would want to put affordable housing in this town. And I think it's awful that we're trying to put that in there again. So that's okay. all. Thank you. Judy DeAngelis, 217 Riverneck Road. So I'm on the other side of this project. So with all the work that we did with Davis and the road studies and the school studies, I'm looking where that driveway is coming out too. Is that right on that dead man corner coming around after the Smarts house? So you come around, it's a blind corner, and from this it looks like that's where the driveway is. So there are going to be children in there, let's not kid ourselves. So we had to go through all of this with Mammoth and Davis and the bus stops and the ability for the buses to stop, coming around that corner is definitely a blind corner. And if that driveway is where I think it is, there's a problem. So just getting that spit out there. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, we have a couple more. Uh, my name is Judy Clock, 21 Carter Drive. Um, we are right behind um, on, on Cotter Drive. Um, we are right next to the brook. Um, we went to many, 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 many meetings opposing the other 40B, which was way too dense. I agree with everything Ruth has said. She could say it much better than I can because she's much more knowledgeable about all of the regulations, but I'm concerned about, you know, it just is common sense to put that dense. I understand we need affordable housing, but this location is just not suited to such a dense um, development. It's still dense, and I'm afraid that the excavation will cause more flooding. We have the wells in that area every year for the past two or three years. We have scientists come through our yard and study the rare turtles. So there are rare turtle species. There are multiple reasons why this is an inappropriate site, you know. Um, but the biggest one is that if you just go, it drops off, it's wetlands. I'm afraid it's going to flood more. And then, I mean, we've been having problems with our water the last year, too, turning yellow and all sorts of things. And, you know, I'm just concerned about the wells in that area, too. So. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, Eric Finney, Clark Ave. Um, I'm not in a butter, but I'm uh, like a, a few streets down, uh, down the road. Um, the thing that like struck me with this project and 
um, I was around for the, uh, the the last time there was a proposal for the site. Um, it's just the uh, topography, like it doesn't work. We've kind of already highlighted that. I have concerns about that, but um, you know, with the recent sewer moratorium, um, and I, I'm I'm concerned about what that you know, if you allow something like this in with a, hi a higher density, um, with we when we already have concerns about the sewer, like, um, and if if it does become a problem, like, a, what does that really mean to the rest of us? Um, you know, if we're increasing the capacity beyond what we think um, that our, our system can handle, like, what does that look like down the road? Like, are we going to have sewer backups? Are they not going to be able to process the waste? Like, a, what does that really mean? Um, I'm, I'm not a, a sewer engineer, so I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there for you guys to think about. Um, the other thing I look at the site and, like, I'm knowing the uh, topography and how, how it, it looks kind of crammed in to me, um, like really dense, like uh, snow removal, um, fire equipment, access, um, you know, waste pickup. Like, how does that flow through that site? Um, you've got a, a steep hill down there that they said it's going to be a driveway, um, like a, not a roadway. Um, what does that look like? You know, trucks are going to be going back down, like, go go down in the, uh, into that uh, driveway down to the, to the end, or our residents going to have to, like, haul their trash out. You know, like, what does this, all, all this look like? You know, all of our uh, operational support that we have in town. Um, so that's all. I just wanted to, to okay. mention that. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else here? No, okay. Real quick. Yeah, my name's Chad Downs. I live right across the street from it. And, uh, you know, this is the first time I've seen this guy. He hasn't come talk to the abutters at all. He, they try to minimize it by saying it's, it's going to be a driveway. If people are coming and going, that's a road to me. They get, what are they going to pull over into the, the, the side to let someone go? Some of these buildings are nine feet apart. They're 20 feet from the road with no sidewalk. Well, if they put a sidewalk in, you're going to have a house, a three-story house, 15 feet from a road? That's like from me to you. That's, that's basically all i got to say about that. Uh, and if you look to the right of that, it's a huge pond. And there's a pumping station behind it. If they excavate that place and there's a rainstorm, there's no hay bale going to stop all that water. That's all I got to say. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, we have another one. Anne Marie Smart, 223 Riverneck Road. I live right next to this project, and this is the first I've heard. Um, I have a question. You mentioned if the previous owner, I believe that's Princeton, connected with this company, with this group, then there's a possibility, maybe slim, but there's a possibility that this could go from that back to the original 44 buildings. Did I misunderstand that? Uh, town Council could maybe answer that. Yeah. yeah, so the original comprehensive permit is still valid, but right now the... Valid for how many units? For the 48 units okay. that it was approved for. So it's possible that this could turn into 48 units? So right now the, the permit holder and the property owner are separated. In the right. sense, in the but sense they that have no reason not to join together. Well, I think that there's a pretty significant history of animosity between the two. So I, I agree yeah. that the potential exists. I okay, don't that's, that, that's, that was the only thing I wanted to know. There is right. definitely a potential. There is because a potential. we've seen, I mean, I've been here for a long time, and we've seen things that weren't going to happen, and they happened. You know, Monmouth Street's one of them. They were never going to make that road the access road and now they were talking about luckily they're not doing it but they told us they would never do it and we're fighting to get it not done so that's that's scary thank you okay thank you anyone else is there anyone on zoom paul no there's no one requesting on zoom um, madam chair since i've been sitting here looking at the board of appeals meeting minutes from february 3rd 2022 this was before the Board of Appeals um, for Administrative Review, and I'll just read the motion. M Mr. Patel was there at the hearing and so forth. The motion was made to approve the extension request to Riverneck Road Realty Trust until March 7, 2024, which will run concurrently with the COVID extension 
that was seconded by Ms. Brown. The roll call vote, vote was unanimous. The extension was granted. So there was, a, there was an extension granted by the Board of Appeals till March 7th, 2024. So it's expired. I don't know if there's anything since then, but that's okay. all I've been able I, to find. I think it ran concurrent with the COVID extension. Right. And so that was the this board would board extended to right. September. So it's actually, I don't know. Well, well if it's running concurrent, then right. it wouldn't yeah. right. extend it beyond that. Right. Wow. That's how the motion reads to approve the extension request to Rivernick Road Realty Trust until March 7th, 2024, which shall run concurrently with the COVID extension. Okay, well, that might need some more research, but so I just thank wanted you. to point thank you. Five okay. To the board. okay, so um, anybody on the board? Uh, uh, Virginia, you said you had some concerns you'd like to tell us about. Well, um, I guess just some suggestions I have in terms of going forward. Um, I'd like to see the department letters answered because I think there's a lot in there that we at least need to know what the top level answer is even if there's more work to be done later with the ZBA. Um, I'm very, I, I need more information about the wetlands and the habitat species. Um, it appears to me that our conservation agent gave input but in the time frame that he was given didn't have time to go back to the full commission to discuss this so i would like to um, give the conservation commission an opportunity to put this on one of their agendas and give the board some formal feedback sure makes makes sense yeah um I appreciate the added number of units in terms of the total benefits. I would just point out that uh, the community development director's comments also stated that uh, typically a 50, at least some of them at 50% is more beneficial to the town. Um, and then my other question with community benefits, and I'm just thinking back to other development agreements and things that we've done. I don't know how this typically works, but are there other benefits being offered to the town, either financially or in terms of the conservation land that's there? Um, you know, what are the community benefits to doing something like this? I'm a little bit concerned about the list of waivers and the assumptions that say things like, we're not going to worry about the subdivision regulations if this doesn't go to the planning board i think they're still wholly relevant because somebody thought through that and i get concerned about the setbacks and some of the other things that uh, people brought up i'm, I'm just uh I'm, I'm assuming we're okay and it's it's okay but i'm a little bit confused about the two abutter lists that are in our packet the one that is a separate attachment up front is much shorter than the one in the applicant's packet. So I think it's well, important. Well, I, I know when in our policy, they have to do abutters to abutters within 300 feet. So that might be why. Is that what the, the, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not worried about it because it looks like the, um, the one that's up front in the packet that's smaller is a subset of, right. of the one that was actually used. You like the direct abutters? Um, I still feel uncomfortable with the sewer question. I don't know if there's any way that we can get any more information to help inform us, recognizing that the full up process would be at the ZBA level. I would like more information to help us understand the density and the traffic impacts. Um, I'm guessing this board doesn't go off and do traffic studies, but something simple, even like how many, um, how many residences are currently in that area? And then, you know, what kind of an increase does uh, the additional development provide? And I had the same concerns about the traffic out onto River Neck Road, given what some of the other boards have looked at in that area. I, I don't know if there's any way that someone can help us verify some of the concerns or the, just the facts about the contours, the wetland lines, the land, the slopes. Um, because we seem to have conflicting input on that. I would like to understand what the density of the development itself is in, in terms of it's not, it's not on the full acreage of the site, right? That we were given the number 2.44 <coughs> units per acre, but what does that density really represent? 
Um, and then my other question, well, my other um, suggestion is that if we are going to be making a recommendation one way or the other, perhaps it would be appropriate uh, if the applicant is open to this, to hosting this board for a site visit so we can better understand what we're looking at beyond the paper. Okay, thank you. Erin, do you have any comments? Um, mine are pretty pretty similar to Virginia's. I, I would like to hear more from the DPW regarding some of these bullets here. Number seven, they um, talked about the overflow discharge, the pump station and the generator, and sewer capacity, of course, is a huge one. And I also, yeah, I found the conservation's letter particularly concerning that they've been previously twice denied under the Protection Act. So I'd like to hear more about that. Um, and I, I would kind of be interested to get clarified when their comprehensive permit actually expires, if it's March 7th or uh, September. Um, and then kind of what the procedure is, I guess, if they, if we don't grant them the lip. Well, then they can go and do it the, the other way we've done it. You yeah. Know, with the other, three, the other three that we have before this, so. Yeah, I guess, yeah, kind of the benefits that would be in us granting them a lip, if there right, are any benefits in us yeah. granting it. Yeah, um, I mean, they've told us a couple, so, yeah. Yeah. Okay. George, any comments? Well, concerns? I am on the Housing Advisory Board. Okay. But we didn't go into this detail for the whole thing, but I think initially the single family was going to be like five homes, then it was extended to six and then seven, but I think that's where the 50% came in. Uh, I, and I heard that as an afterthought, I think, because I think that discussion was with Evan and maybe and, and the Mr. Uh, with the uh, Housing Authority uh, on the 50%, uh, you know. Uh, the AMI? AMI, yeah. Portability. So, um, is, am I correct on that? Uh, May I, Madam Chair, sure. respond? Um, so, uh, so the answer is yes. When we when we looked at this initially, there was some discussion at the early conceptual stage, probably a year or so ago, uh, even before my involvement, of potentially five single-family homes at the rear. Um, when we prepared the concept plan that we brought to the Housing Advisory Board and got support from the board on, it had six single-family homes. We then ran the numbers and recognized that we needed to provide two of the single-family homes as affordable units. And providing two of the six, or a third of the units, was uneconomic. And so we added the seventh home to the rear, which is why I slipped up earlier and said six, because that was in my mind, because when we presented earlier, it was six. Um, we added the seventh home so that we could designate two of those homes as affordable. But that is correct. That is the evolution of the plan. Okay. Thank you. I had the same problem as... Uh, Can Pat you talk had, into the microphone, uh, George? Counting. Oh, I'm sorry. I had the same problem as Pat had accounting. When you were giving the numbers out, uh, I had different numbers than you did. And I thought maybe I wasn't adding them up correctly, so I'm glad he asked the question. But so anyway, so I thought they had agreed. Uh, I mean, it was it did get an okay from the Housing Advisory Board based on a few things, but I think a lot of the things have been changed since some of the things have been changed. I wasn't crazy about the size of the 3,000 square foot house, all of them being 3,000 square foot houses. To me, that's not a, a workforce house, but um, it's a matter of an opinion. So um, I'm just telling you what my opinion was. Um, but I think, you know, 50% would be, uh, or at least le le less than 70% anyway would be, on a couple of them would be a lot better than, you know, advantageous to the town. If, in fact, they were going to go, if this plan was approved. Just for my my input. Thank okay. you, Pat. Um, similar concerns to uh, Virginia and Aaron. Um, one thing uh, further to that is I I really want to get a handle on what our obligations are as far as sewer um, is concerned, um, because if it goes the other way. Um, I guess, and probably either way, I'd probably want to get an idea as to the soils out there just uh, because if there was over-excavation during the highway project, then that could lead to a host of other issues over there. Um, so some soil condition reports might be in order. And then uh, I agree um, with Pat that um, 
uh, a meet site walk would be appropriate. And I guess a question right now is, is it currently flagged for wetlands? And if it is, when was it flagged? And if it's not, can it be flagged? Hi, Tim Power, uh, civil engineer. Um, so just to answer your question about the wetlands, uh, what is shown on the plan was the uh, previously approved uh, ANRAD that was there. Uh, and just as part of the process, we discussed when it would be appropriate to go back to conservation and get them reflagged. So it's not an official ORAD yet, uh, but that was as last, uh, last approved as what was shown. The, so. the previously approved what, sir? Previously approved wetlands, the ORAD, the Order of Resource Area when Delineation. Was that? Uh, for the previous development effort, um, I don't know exactly when it expired, but we used that as a starting point just to create our concept. And So that would be back, you know, 2006, somewhere around there. Yeah, I think it expired with the superseding order of conditions uh, is when that wetland delineation would have also expired, which only would have been, uh, I believe, a couple of years ago. Could we have that? flagged prior to a site walk? Uh, I think we can. I think we re-hung the flags, the surveyor, when he was last there. And so someone can take a look and, and reconfirm them or move them uh, based on what was needed. So we certainly can have it uh, flagged. Uh, but have to... Flagged to today's conditions. Not Correct. to 2006. Correct. Okay. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And, I, you know, I agree with, you know, I have the same concerns that everybody else has raised. Uh, one thing, one of the uh, 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 butters from the public here mentioned also was about sidewalks, the, you know, especially given how close together the, the, the uh, buildings are. Um, in, our, in our LIP policy, it does uh, require that the Housing Authority provide comments. I know, y you know, you did orally give us some of those comments. I would like to see something in writing, and we, you know, I can follow up with, with David Hedison over at the Housing Authority to, to make sure that we get that so that he, uh, he can give us a sense for uh, the benefits of, of this project if it were to go forward. Um, I mean, I, I would like to see the narrative redone so it is accurate, so we don't have the discrepancies in the numbers, um, and with and with the other other documents that you provided. Um, and neighborhood outreach, I think, is is critically important. I mean, you see, the room is filled here tonight. Um, I think whatever you can do to to reach out to them and um, alleviate some of their concerns is is definitely going to be beneficial. Um, as Virginia mentioned, a, a site visit would be good with things marked out so we can see, you know, even if you could, where the buildings are going to be um, in addition to the, to the wetlands. Um, is there anything else that we, and we, and we want to wait at least till the next, till the Conservation Commission has a chance to weigh in on this again. I just have a, a question for my own education. George mentioned the Housing Advisory Board. Is there an output from them that we should be looking at? Now, you said they looked at the, the previous one, or did they look oh, at they this one? Oh, this one, and they, they, they kind of approved, they approved this one. Okay. But it, I don't think it was in the detail that, uh, that we've was seen it, tonight, and, like it, and it, I think it was with the additional, after was with additional, the two, the two additional uh, houses at 50%. So do you think they want another shot at it, too? I mean, we definitely, I mean, you know, I, I think we'd like to get as much input as we can from boards like that. I agree. So, yeah, um, absolutely. So, I think that's another one we'd like to have them, um, you know, review it again and give their feedback if there's any, any other benefits. Is that up to us to ask them to do that, or is that the applicant asking? So, so, Madam Chair, we're, we're happy to make a further submittal, and if the Housing Advisory okay. Board would like to meet with us, that's fine. I, I will say for the record, the plan you see on your screen is the plan that was submitted. Virtually identical, except we only had six residences and not the seventh. We added the seventh residence after the meeting okay. uh, with the Housing Advisory Board. In all other respects, the layout of the site is the same. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Mr. Dixon is correct that the discussion that was had by the Housing Advisory Board was certainly a more brief discussion. I think we had a, maybe an hour-long meeting, maybe not even 45 minutes. Uh, they asked some questions generally. They voted unanimously to support it. Um, they didn't uh, specify that we necessarily needed to designate a greater number of units as affordable or a greater percentage, but they expressed the desire. They said to the extent 
that we could make it work, they would obviously like to see the greatest affordability possible. So um, we're happy to go back and, and run our numbers again. And if the Housing Advisory Board wants to look at it and make comments, they can do that. If they prefer to meet with us, we're happy to make a further appearance. Okay. All right. So so we'll leave it to you to follow up with uh, their representatives, see if they want to have a meeting or that's fine. Or, or what, well, how we move forward with that. Is that okay with you, George? Yeah, that's Sounds fine. Good. Debbie, uh, Debbie uh, oh, oh, uh, Evan, would, Evan would probably be the one to talk to him. He would set it up. Can I ask okay. one more question? Sure. Can I just ask one more question, just for my own maybe personal understanding of the affordable conversation? Sure. So I'm looking at your comparables here, and it looks like they are all kind of in the 1.1 1, 1. 1 to one point four million dollar range the single family homes yes the yes. single family homes so is that I would I assume that the range that these houses you'd be kind of looking at pricing in so, so that that's possible I mean uh, with with um, doing a market study on a project of this sort is obviously difficult right yeah. because if you find single family homes on one and a half acre lots or one acre yeah. lots they're going to be treated differently than a single family home that um, is surrounded by other single family yeah. homes in a rental and the market changes and things uh, like that but. correct but the, the idea behind the market study is to give us some sense so that when we're preparing the pro forma yeah we have a, a sense as to what revenues might be so we can determine determine whether the project is yeah. profitable. So then the affordable units, the affordable, even at um, the the lower AMI, at the 50% AMI? They're not offering that. I'm oh, sorry? They only offered to go as low as 70. 70. 70 is what you'd be offering. So the, the standard for uh, Chapter 40B developments that all of the subsidizing agency require is between 70 and 80. They, yeah. they want to create a window of affordability. Yeah. So we have committed to do what the programmatic requirements would require us to do. Um, and that's 70 to 80 percent. What we're offering today is in the interest of recognizing we need to work with the board under the LIP um, pr project uh, policy to provide some additional benefit, we'd be happy to reduce the AMI to the extent we can. What we proposed is for the six units within the rental uh -huh. development, we would provide th uh, three of those six at, at 70 percent AMI and three of those six at 60 percent AMI. Now I've heard a number of members say tonight that they'd prefer uh, us to go if we can to as low as 50 percent and obviously offer as many as we can. So we can try and rework the numbers and see if we can so get from lower. So practical standpoint, just so I have a, a number in my brain, for like if, if the the uh, market price units were to go for 1.2, then what would those two AMI at, even if you were to hit 50 percent? They wouldn't hit no, 50. No, the 80 percent. So, so, so the, the, the numbers Numbers. I, I can't do the numbers at fifty percent on the spot because it's a it's a calculation, a formula yeah. you input the but the numbers we did submit with the application was based upon the seventy to eighty percent. Okay. And the single family homes were gonna be between two twenty five and two sixty five. Okay. 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 Thank you. Mm -hmm. And and if you could on, on your plans, um, has been brought up um, about the, the location of the driveway, if it could be, excuse me, could you please keep the chatter down? Um, if you could more clearly show where the driveway is going to be and, and, and the width of it so people can see how, you know, there were concerns about driveway versus road, um, how, how wide it's going to be to allow for traffic, and the, um, any egress through Forest Street that might be anticipated, the, the one um, neighbor had mentioned about that. Pat, may I ask another question sure. about that? <clears throat> so if I look at that driveway um, at about 1 o'clock, is that a fire truck turnaround, an emergency vehicle turnaround? That, that's correct. So, so what happens if they go all the way into the development? How are they turning around? So um, so one of the comments, you can see we have a turnaround at the end, but it's not nearly as deep. No, it wouldn't accommodate a fire truck. So one of the comments that was made by DPW, I think it was, it might have been the fire department, fire it was chief. in one of the two letters, was that they needed a better better access okay. for turnaround. Thank so I've you. discussed that with the engineer, but we just got those comments okay. at the end of last week, so we Thank haven't you. adjusted the site. <clears throat> okay, so I think it's apparent that we're not going to finish this hearing this evening. Right. Um, we have another meeting in two weeks, and we have one in four weeks. Um, would you have a preference? Do you want to come back in two weeks? Do you think you'd be prepared, or should we wait for four weeks? So, and um, if we want the conservation commission, we won't have it in two weeks because they're meeting tomorrow, and they haven't, they don't have this on their agenda. Okay, we might have to wait then until our May meeting. And, and that's, my, I'm sure my clients are anxious and they're, think, they, they're oh, thinking sure. two weeks, but I, I realize that there's a lot to do. So one of the questions I'd have for the board, you've, you've referenced the potential site visit. Uh, obviously, site visits are 
exempt under the open Correct. meeting law. They're not meetings. So uh, would you like us to try and coordinate between now and our return in four weeks, uh, a date and time when we could make the site available? We need to coordinate. We, we'd offer something today, but we need to speak to the property owner. Um, but we can find the date when that would sure. work. I or think that'd, of be, dates. that'd be really good to okay. do that before the next meeting. Yeah, okay. we can do that. Okay. So four weeks would be fine, and we'll try and coordinate that site visit to occur between now and then. Okay. And it would be good if we could have some flagging done right. prior to that visit. Sure. Do we? So we don't have our May schedule, May but 6th. are we assuming we're meeting on Monday the 6th after right. town meeting? Correct, yeah. So we need to continue the public hearing. So unless there's any other questions, yeah, I would take a motion to continue oh. the public hearing. Just the public hearing. I will make a motion to continue the public hearing for um, the local initiative project at 243 River Neck Road. Do I need to recall that? No. Just to get um, the date. To May 6th. May 6th, 2024. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Uh, okay, we'll see you in four weeks. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you to everybody who came and for your patience. Okay, the next item on our agenda um, is the discussion about uh, the development agreement potential modification for 255 Princeton Street. And I believe Chris um, Valley is going to make this presentation. Is he still? There he is. For the record, Chris Lavalley, Vice Chair of the Planning Board. If those folks are going to stay out there, you might. Okay. Thanks, John. So while Paul is finding the slides, what I can do is go through the slides um, and then uh, towards the end of the presentation, uh, we have some information about the developer agreement um, recommendations from the planning board that we can go over. Okay. You guys have a big packet. <laughs> yeah, it's getting through the, the one that we just finished, yeah. A little bit further, Paul. It's after the warrant. It's after yeah. the warrant, yeah. yeah. Here it is. To blow it up. Okay. Um, so in to give you some background on the MBTA zoning. Uh, in 2021, Governor Baker uh, signed the amendment to the Zoning Act. Essentially, it designated 177 communities uh, in scope of this law that are either MBTA communities or MBTA adjacent communities. Um, M Lowell and Bill Ricca are identified as MBTA communities, and because we abut both, we are an MBTA adjacent community. Um, what this law requires is that we have zoning ordinance um, that permits multifamily housing by right um, in certain zones that we designate in town. And you can go to the next slide. So why is the state doing this? Um, essentially, it's their attempt at uh, trying to solve the housing crisis, greater production of housing, uh, making sure that we have uh, housing near public transportation, and addressing the, the, what they call the uh, missing middle housing. Next slide. So what does this new law require? Um, it requires us that we create at least one zoning district of reasonable size where multifamily housing is permitted by right and meets a number of other criteria in their uh, statute. We cannot have age restrictions in the zoning. It has to be suitable for families, uh, minimum gross density of 15 units per acre in the zoning. Uh, it has to be at least 50 acres where 10% of the, the current housing stock uh, could be built by right. And it's based on the uh, 2020 census, so it, it comes out to about 1,477 units. 
Half of the uh, zoning must be contiguous with no portion less than five contiguous acres. It has to be a neighborhood scale district, um, not a single site. So we wouldn't be able to scatter these sites throughout the town. Um, and if you go to the next slide, you can see. So what they are trying to address is that mi missing middle housing. And what the planning board strategy was to do is to really target the lowest possible density uh, that we could, um, we could work with. And that, that target was 15 units per acre. If you notice, the, uh, some of the larger buildings are, are other parts of the missing middle, um, but we decided to uh, target the, the 15 units per acre. Next slide. So in looking at what areas to zone for this MBTA zoning, we decided to really look at what our strategy was. We wanted to minimize any negative impacts um, any negative impacts to wetlands over development of single areas. We wanted to minimize the likelihood of short-term development and aim for longer term. Uh, this is because we do have a number of constraints on our infrastructure. We wanted to maximize any positive impacts if there were any. Um, we wanted to uh, put them up close to the LRTA bus routes. We wanted to base the new MBTA zoning on our current multifamily zoning, as well as the UMass uh, West multifamily overlay district zoning. We wanted to minimize potential decrease of commercial property because of this. We wanted to increase the area, the acres in scope from 50 to 100 in order to decrease and keep the density down. And we wanted to select areas that are currently developed and have a low probability of redevelopment primarily to target that long to uh, longer term um, strategy. Planning board process. Uh, it started in June 2023. We worked, we started working with NEMCOG who have helped us uh, significantly uh, guide us in the process, interpret the state requirements. Uh, they worked with us to perform the scenario modeling for each of the areas that we were looking at. Um, in June and July, we started to understand the requirements in the law, brainstormed areas, and then in early September, we started doing the anal analysis of the area models to narrow down the list. In September, we narrowed it down to a few areas uh, where we presented uh, these areas to the public and gathered their input. It was UMass West, the UPS area, and the 110 area. In October, we um, looked at additional areas uh, that we had um, uh, been given input from the uh, public in different areas in town. We looked at those and, and modeled them and did some analysis. In November, we uh, went to town committees, boards, and departments to gather additional input. Um, and we selected two areas uh, to propose uh, to you and the rest of the uh, town meeting. Um, in November, we, we brainstormed uh, er things that we wanted in the new zoning. And in November is when we also made the decision to really uh, base the MBTA zoning on our current zoning uh, for multifamily and for the overlay, uh, UMass West overlay. And now we're in the process of the outreach uh, to different boards and to town meeting reps uh, to get the, uh, the final push. For the districts reviewed, I'm not gonna go through every one of these, um, but we did look across town at various areas. Uh, we looked at Riverneck Road, uh, the Davis Company parcels. Uh, they did approach us to include it in the analysis, so we did. We looked at the Radisson properties. Um, we looked all across town. The two areas that we did select are the UMass West area, and then the uh, 110 West uh, multifamily area. So in the next slides, I start getting into a little bit more of the details for the areas. Uh, so the UMass West area includes the UMass West uh, overlay property, as well as the two condo uh, properties uh, attached to it, Windermere and Meadowood. Next slide. So this gives you some uh, information about the area. 
so its gross area acreage is about 70 acres. Uh, the developable density is about 18, but the gross density uh, comes out to about 15 acres. So that gives a, uh, a capacity of this zone uh, at just over 1,000 units. Um, for comparison's sake, we wanted to include these numbers about what it could be developed as versus what it currently is to give you some idea of how big it could get uh, if it were ever redeveloped uh, under this overlay. So the current units in these areas, um, including the uh, units that are currently under development, is about 522 units. Um, if everything were essentially leveled and rebuilt uh, according to this overlay, uh, it would only have added 521 units on top of those units. So it's not a an, an, an thousand additional units to the town, it would be a 500 unit add. In the next section, we include um, the 110 district multifamily area of Ledgewood, Fox Hunt, and six of the eight Woodcrest buildings, as well as the Enterprise Bank property. Uh, this provides a gross density of 15 units per acre. Uh, the capacity of this area is 477. And again, for comparison's sake, um, it would be uh, a doubling of size under this overlay. So this gives uh, modeled uh, information about the uh, entire area. Um, again, we are, instead of the minimum 50 acres, we're looking at 100 acres to keep the uh, units per acre down. At the, uh, at the minimum capacity, if we kept it at 50 acres, it would be about 30 units per acre, which would be incredibly dense for our town. So we looked at 100 acre uh, areas and that keeps us down at the 15 unit density. So people are concerned about um, how big these buildings could be. Um, again, because they are following our current zoning, it would be limited to three stories. Um, and all of our design features and, and current uh, zoning requirements would still apply. Uh, and these are the, the current areas of 175 uh, Littleton Road for Glenbrook, Woodcrest, and Fox Hunt. And this is essentially what we would also get under the, the proposed zoning bylaw. So to give you some highlights, um, maximum density that we're proposing in the zoning is 15 units per acre, nothing more. It limits the buildings to three stories. Uh, permits only up to 24 units in a single building and not more than six dwelling units from a single entrance. Again, mirroring what we currently have in town. Uh, it allows townhouses and, and the medium multiplex style buildings. We uh, require varying architectural elements so it's not a boxy looking building. Um, we include recreational open space as well as uh, bicycle storage. All right, so we, in March 18th, um, or sorry, March 6th, we received a letter or an email um, from uh, EOL, EOL, EOHLC uh, from the state um, that essentially guided us uh, with their preliminary re review of our submission. Um, they had some minor concerns with the language uh, pretty minor. We made the edits in our March uh, 13th meeting. Uh, but since then, uh, they did give us the official letter, which as you probably know by now, included an additional uh, con significant concern of the developer agreement. The reason why this is such a concern is not because of the restrictions themselves, per se but because the town has entered in the agreement, uh, so it's essentially uh, usurping the zoning uh, that we're trying to put in. So there are three main concerns with the developer agreement are re uh, related to capacity. Uh, the developer agreement requires, I believe it's either 12 or 13 
um, units per acre, which is 77 units below uh, compliance. It requires 15% affordability, uh, which exceeds the current level in the, the zoning bylaw of 10%. Uh, we are working on uh, trying to get a feasibility study to increase that, that percent in the bylaw to 15%, uh, but we don't have that yet, so the uh, bylaw as it currently stands is 10%. The last one is the age restriction, um, and that is in direct conflict with uh, Section 3A uh, being suitable for families with children. So at our last board meeting, um, we did discuss this significantly, um, and we are still recommending we move ahead with this uh, with the uh, developer agreement uh, being uh, amended is our recommendation. I will get to the proposed timeline and why we get to that in a minute, uh, but essentially, um, these are the reasons why we feel that uh, amending the developer agreement based on that timeline is relatively is very low risk. The first is that the site is built out um, with approved plans. So if you look at the site plans, you can see the site plan. It's hard to see on that slide, but essentially there's no more space on the site for a building with 77 units and the required additional parking. They would need to re redesign that site completely. And that's unlikely to happen at this point in their development. The project is fully financed, fully permitted, and actively under construction. Uh, things are being uh, developed as we speak, and it's unlikely to change course at this time. However, if they were to change course, um, it would require significant modifications to the plans. And these are the additional hurdles that they would have to go through in order for uh, the building to take place. So any permits that were pulled after July 1st would be um, applicable under the uh, Enhanced Energy Stretch Code. Currently, they have all of their permits, uh, so they don't have to comply with the, the stretch code. Uh, if we were to um, amend the developer agreement after July 1st and they would pull new permits, they would have to redesign all of their buildings to comply with the new code. Uh, they would also have to refile under the MEPA uh, filing. The Planning Board and Conservation Commission would have to re-review re and approve the site plans. They would have to have a North Chelmsford Water District uh, review and, uh, to add ca to capacity. And any potential design changes to add capacity to the units would require a redesign on their wastewater treatment plant with additional capacity. And that would require additional reviews and approvals from DEP. We have confirmed that the current uh, design does not allow for increased uh, capacity beyond usual spikes, occasional spikes as well. So they certainly don't have capacity to uh, add 77 units. So this is our proposed timeline of next steps. Um, we anticipate that in late March, the regulatory agreements for the uh, age-restricted affordable choice units and the six affordable units um, are likely to uh, be approved in the next uh, few months. May 2nd, we are proposing the town meeting vote with the anticipation that we would change the developer agreement to, to bring come in, on, in compliance. We are proposing on June 2nd and early June, we get the approvals from the state attorney general after their 90 day review of the zoning. And in early June, uh, the regulatory agreements would be approved. Uh, the September, the Attorney General would issue their decision on the zoning uh, from town meeting. And that's when we would anticipate um, the discussions and the execution of the recorded uh, developer agreement uh, modification. And then in December is our deadline for submitting all of this to uh, the state. So the key takeaways are that we have to comply with state law. 
Uh, there are two areas that we selected for compliance with the state law while minimizing impact and likelihood of development. Uh, they are extremely low probability of being redeveloped, even with the amendment to the developer agreement. Uh, the new MBTA zoning is based on our current multifamily and UMass West overlay district, so there are really no changes to the zoning. And currently, we are including a 10% affordable housing requirement, uh, but we do have every intention of increasing that to 15% once we are able to get the feasibility study completed. Okay, does anyone have any questions for Chris? I have a question. Sure. So the, the, um, in regards to the age restriction, age restricted units, mm -hmm. the, um, Multifamily housing should be without age restrictions and shall be suitable for families with children. Is there not a three bedroom requirement for family units? And because the age restricted units that the, we plan on building are one bedroom units, right? Or maybe two bedroom? I, d I do not believe that that restriction needs to be in the zoning. So <clears throat> the 10% three bedroom unit requirement is a requirement that was adopted by the state subsidizing agencies as it relates to chapter 40B development. For being suitable with families and children, it was required for three bedrooms, right? Well, the, the requirement for 10% three bedroom is in the chapter 40B area. It's not part of this statute. Okay. So while the statute does say it should be suitable for families with children, there's no specific requirement in terms of the number of bedrooms. Okay. Interesting. Okay, any other questions for Chris? So Chris, you're talking about amending the developer the developer agreement. Is there cost associated with them changing the agreement and are they willing to just do that or I am not sure. That, that would be our question, because <laughs> we hold the developer agreement. Yeah, the developer agreement is not in our purview. That's under your purview, so I would have no idea. Paul, Paul have anything? Yeah, Paul has some. Yeah, so there wouldn't be a cost per se associated with amending the developer agreement as, as it relates to the developer's side of things. Um, you know, there may be a, a minimal expense for them and having their attorney review it and, and sort of participate in that process with the town. Um, all of the provisions of the development agreement uh, are something that, you know, is adding cost to the developer um, or restricting um, uh, revenues for the developer. So they don't really have any concerns with, uh, they shouldn't have any concerns with amending the development agreement other than they did go through an extensive process with the neighborhood and that development agreement was part of sort of the selling point for getting that zoning change. So to the extent that they have any hesitation in coming to the, to the table and amending this, that would be the nature of it, not because that there's going to be any cost associated to them. And my understanding is that um, Evan Volansky has been in, com in con conversations with the a representative from the developer and is working to get something in writing that they will agree to these changes but basically not change their development. Correct. We do have an email um, from Mark Baransky uh, that the um, subject to – Subject to Trammell Crow, uh, their investment partners and debt ent entity and other interested parties doing a full legal review and getting comfortable that there's no negative impact upon the project, they would agree to cooperate with the town and amend the developer agreement. I just have a follow-up question from what Pat just said. So um, Pat said they would give us a letter saying they agree to the development agreement modifications and they wouldn't change anything that they're doing but can they actually put in they wouldn't change anything that they're doing that won't pass muster with the state will it yeah i mean essentially that would be a side development agreement deal and i i don't if, i mean if the state got wind of that you know would be still faced with the same problem okay. so 
what I, Chris had the three biggies on there the um, the the sewer capacity no no no, no. in terms of in terms of the development agreement modifications you had the affordability restriction the age restriction and the maximum number of units or the yeah, the capacity and my understanding is it's still unclear from the state from the discussions that you guys had today whether we have other things in that development agreement there were financial agreements that were made there was an easement granted to the Augusta and St. Andrews Way community there's a conservation restriction um, so what how do we how do we get to a level of confidence that if we go modify this development agreement the state's not going to come back and say keep gutting it some more because we are really gutting it and I let me just say I think you guys have done a phenomenal job and I'm like 90 to 97 percent of the way there so I'm not trying to find reasons not to do this I just want to get our ducks in line so I, I will say Evan and I did have a, a zoom meeting this morning with representatives from EOHLC <clears throat> they were not willing to make any commitments in terms of what revisions to the development agreement would satisfy them and addition in addition to the big three and as Virginia just sort of alluded to there are a number of other provisions in this development agreement that they had questions about um, including the uh, the payment as mitigation to the schools um, there's other payments in there um, there was the traffic mitigation payments essentially what they're looking at with regards to those is are those the sort of requirements that could be included as part of a site plan approval process or is this something that's sort of above and beyond what would be allowed as that my argument to them was that it would not be at all uncommon to have some sort of impact payments as part of a site plan approval process um, so I, I think that we can make an argument that these should be allowed to remain but they are not committing one way or the other to that and um, the development agreement said that an easement would be granted to the Augusta and St. Andrews Way intersection. So once that, can you clarify, like what happened, once that easement is granted, does the development agreement matter anymore? No. Once the agreement has is, is been granted and the is easement? on record, I'm sorry, the, the, the uh -huh. easement has been granted and is on record, it remains. It doesn't matter whether or not the provision in the development agreement is stricken. It remains how? It, it's it goes on, with the property? It deed? runs with the land. It's on, it's on the property and it cannot be amended or rescinded without the agreement of the, the parties that benefit from that easement. And so that was, my recollection was that was like 20 something acres? No. 20, no, 20 something thousand square feet. Yeah. It's not that significignant so it would the 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 um the <laughs> state wouldn't care about that much of the land being deed restricted from an MBTA zoning standpoint I, no, you can't I, go ahead I'm asking Paul yeah i I don't know if the state has raised any concerns with that, but again, they have not <coughs> committed to to any provision. Of the development agreement um, being allowed to remain and so the the original agreement had three parties it was Princeton properties who owned the land Trammell Co Crow and um, the choice whatever the organization is affiliated with with choice if, it, it if was, Trammell Crow it, owns the land have, have, do we have to modify the parties on the agreement as well if we start doing this since Trammell Crow now owns the land and not Princeton properties it, it would have to be whoever is the current owner of the property they would be the ones that would execute for the property owner and then the developer would execute for them and if there's an identity of interest you know they can execute for both okay and I'm just thinking about the timeline. There's a requirement in the Trammell Crow Agreement in Section 10 and in the Choice Agreement in Section 4 that the final amend, the way I interpreted it is any amendment can't be <coughs> finalized until there's a duly noticed public meeting. 
So that wouldn't necessarily be us getting input from the neighbors to make this decision. It would be once we make the decision to do it and we're ready to execute it, we have to have another public meeting to, to, to notify the public that we are going to formally modify this agreement. I, I That's think the to, way I read that. I think to be on the safe side, definitely with regards to the notice, yeah. we want to have a, a notice to any abutter who may uh, you know, be impacted by the revision of the development agreement. Okay. And can you remind me, under? so I understand we have the two regulatory agreements that we filed, right? Trammell Crow is marching along. Under what condition will the choice regulatory agreement expire or be invalid? Is it if they don't get their permitting or their financing? The, the, the choice regulatory agreement, once it's executed and recorded, will remain in place. I heard discussion in the, in the other meetings that there's a risk right now that at some point this year it could be rendered invalid because they haven't gotten their financing or their permitting. No, no. So th th this goes to whether or not the units can be counted on the, the town's subsidized housing inventory. Okay. So within one year of the date that the units were approved by, the, in this case, it was an administrative decision from the community development office because that's how the original Trammell Crow approval yeah. was, was issued. Within one year of that, the units can be added to your SHI, presuming that a regulatory agreement has been executed sometime in that one-year period. But after 12 months of the issuance of that decision, those units come off of the town's subsidized so housing that's where inventory. We're, well, that's where we right. have potential exposure. And then right they now. come back on once a building permit is eventually issued. Okay. And um, Chris's chart pointed out that Windermere and Meadowood are age-restricted communities. So if we go through and change the development agreement, it, <clears throat> it, it, what, is there a possibility that the state comes back and still rejects this proposal because it's got two age-restricted communities in it? No. No? Because that's not a development agreement with the town. Those are local okay. permitting decisions um, that ultimately could be reversed if, if the... <coughs> property owners, you know, ever determined that they were going to come forward and dissolve the condo association and move forward with a different type of development. Okay. And then my, um, my last question related to this is, you, ha you have very well articulated one of the low risk um, factors is that there's no room to build 77 more units. If the current development doesn't necessarily comply with the MBTA zoning, I'm thinking maybe there's another low risk argument here that if they wanted to put 77 more units in under MBTA zoning, would they have to start all over to make the rest of it comply? If Tremel Crow wanted to go through the overlay to, to add the 77 units, they would essentially have to start over from scratch. Because none of the rest of the development complies right now. They would have to find space for the 77 units and there's no physical space. No, 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 I'm just saying I get that argument, but I'm saying is there another one <laughs> that says if they're gonna invoke the overlay, what they're building right now doesn't wholly comply, does it? They wouldn't invoke the overlay. They would go through the underlying zoning which they already have. They can, I, they I, can, they can split the, it? They can put, use the overlay on part of it and the underlay? Well, first of all, yes, they can. Okay. Because it would be, in this instance, two separate overlay districts yep. that would be applicable and they could operate under either one or under the underlying zoning. They can operate under both at but the same I, time? I don't think that, that there's a significant difference between the <coughs> no, two there's not. overlay there isn't. districts. Okay, yeah. thank you. I mean, ultimately, they're both 15 units per acre. Mm -hmm. And are the red lines that are in the warrant article, those would be like a friendly amendment that you're proposing? Yes. Based on I the work so. that you did here? Okay. Yeah, those are, the, um, those are the simple edits that we did in our March 13th meeting. Yeah, Madam Chair, if I may clarify. Hi, sorry, this is Kelly Wyndham. Yes, yes Kelly. Yes, I was going to call Hi, on I you, apologize. Kelly. Go ahead. Yep, yep, no problem. I'm sorry I'm not on camera, but I'm in a car and um, there's very bad lighting in here. So, um, 
the the amendments that are in the zoning right now are basic amendments that uh, that reflect the changes request by HLC uh, that were sent to us by email back in March. And so those are just to clarify exactly what can be allowed by right and what other sections of the zoning bylaw are not applicable. Okay. Uh, Pat, anything else I have is comments or suggestions going forward <coughs> on my questions? Okay, does anybody else have any questions for, for Chris? Okay, now, if you want to give your comments, I mean, as, as has been mentioned, um, one of the reasons that we're here tonight um, is potentially to vote whether to recommend approval of Article 26, I believe it is, in the uh, town meeting warrant. Uh, do you want to make your comments before we talk about that? Um, sure. <laughs> okay. Um, so, I, I, I would like to make a suggestion that perhaps we take a poll of the board so the planning board and the board knows where we stand. I would be more comfortable taking a vote on August 22nd. April. April 22nd, I'm sorry. Um, looking toward putting two things in place. I would like to invite the neighborhoods back because we went through an extensive process from May to February last time with the neighborhoods and them with the developer. And I just feel that we should honor that and allow them to give us some input. And I would like to try to get, if we can, more formal letters from both Choice, because they have their own agreement, and from Trammell Crow that delineate what we're going to change in the development agreement and that they sign off that says, you know, it would be our intention to, to do that. And also to put in there that the, the changes wouldn't go into effect until July 1st or upon approval from town meeting, whichever is later, because that would safeguard us with the, um, the, the July 1st energy milestone that the planning board has identified as <coughs> also helping to mitigate the risk that they would try to do anything different. Well, on, on that point, I, I think the planning board has suggested that we not amend the development agreement until after that point. Right, but so what I'm so th where I'm coming from, I'm trying to get something in place though. Is that um, there's been conversations too about like getting this in front of town meeting and getting it to pass, and that's where my head's at right now. I think um, the last time around, we had signed off the agreement before we went to town meeting. And a large part of selling it at town meeting was the neighborhood saying, we want this, we trust this developer, we'd rather know what's coming than have to battle the next round. So I think from the standpoint of getting it to pass at town meeting, having that conversation here, rather than forcing all the neighborhoods to show up at town meeting un without having had a voice yet, is going to help the process. And I think having something in place, rather than a trust me, we'll go change the development agreement, having something a little more formal from the parties in the development agreement is going to help sell it to town meeting. Um, I, uh, did you want to say something, Chris? Yeah, uh, if, sure. if I could. Yeah. I agree with the public input, 100%. Yeah. Um, my question about the um, letters of intent is that if we pass this at town meeting and we don't change the developer agreement, the state won't accept our changes, our, our zoning. So it has, if we pass this at town meeting, that developer agreement will have to be changed. Exactly. And all I'm saying is before we go to town meeting, let's have something clear in front of town meeting from the parties saying we will commit to changing the development agreement should you pass this. And that those changes that that change would not happen, or maybe we just write don't don't execute it till after July first. But the change wouldn't happen until July first or the approval of town meeting, whichever is later. If I could just jump in, as we noted earlier, we haven't gotten the commitment from EOHLC as to what exactly in the development agreement is going to need to be changed. So it would be it would be helpful to have you know something where we've got an agreement 
from the developer that they will modify the development agreement as necessary, but not execute it until sometime in the future so that we can get that feedback from EOHLC. Okay. Is it, I, is I mean, it, I think your proposal but, but what is if, but, helpful. But, but what, if he, what if HLC comes back and says, we want you to gut a whole bunch of other stuff out? Have we just committed to modify a development agreement that we, I don't think we, so. No? Okay. I would say I no, think you, you can definitely paper it in a way that, you know, we're limits. Not we're not committing. We're not committing anything until we find out from EOHLC what exactly they need to be removed. But, but, but at minimum, we do know they want us to change the capacity and the two restrictions on age and affordability. So we could have them put, we could help them with that language, could we not? Or do you not recommend doing that either? I'm, I'm not suggesting that we don't do that. I will say on the affordability, um, when we noted that we would likely need to change that, EOHLC pointed out that, you know, there is the provision that allows you to petition for up to 15%. So they're not 100% sure they're going to require us. If we're, you know, if we successfully p petition them to, to raise that to 15%, then that provision could actually stay in. Okay. So, uh, again, I think it's helpful to get an agreement in principle with the, the developer to modify as necessary to support um, the MBTA. But, but leaving the details until we actually get feedback from EOHLC. And that I'm okay. I just think it should be yep. something. I, I really feel that you're going to be much stronger going into town meeting if we can get something formalized. And it has to, Choice needs to send us something too. Correct. Um, and I understand that, you know, they're not, they're going to do what they're going to do regardless of whether there's a development agreement in place, but we still need it from them. Um, my only other, I just wanted, if I may, just give you a s couple suggestions about messaging in preparation for going to town meeting. I've heard, um, I went back and watched the entire February of 2022 special town meeting again before this meeting. And I've heard multiple times members of the planning board saying, well, we can tell town meeting we did this zoning with MBTA in mind, you know, and now we just have to modify it. And that's really not accurate and I'm, I'm afraid that if you present it that way you're going to alienate the neighborhood that you need support from and you're going to alienate the town meeting reps who remember because when when Evan presented it in the written word and the spoken word there was absolutely no mention of MBTA and it came up a couple times in questions from the floor and every time it came up, Evan was very honest, saying that is not the selling point here. We don't know enough about MBTA yet. It may possibly help us, but that's this is the reason we're doing this is because it is project-based zoning, and and the community wants it. And so I think that's very important because when you say things, I, I sit in the back of the room at your meetings, and I can see you alienating the neighbors when you say things like that. And mm -hmm. and I don't think it's intentional, but um, I would just go back and refresh and remember what really happened. And then the, the other thing in the messaging is um, a couple times people have said, well, it's just a really straightforward change to, to modify the paper and the development agreement, and that's the, you know, the best thing to do and easiest thing to do. And again, um, for the people who put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears and fears into this, you're alienating them because it really is gutting a lot of that development agreement. And so I wouldn't treat it in such, when it comes across a little bit cavalier, I wouldn't, mm -hmm. I would just be careful of that. Um, and again, I think you guys have done an absolutely phenomenal job. This is such a hard problem. Thank you. Um, so thank you. So Paul, Heavy, I have a question. Um, what is the likelihood that we would know within the next two weeks from HLC what other uh, amendments they might be looking for is it likely or not so I told them that we you know have town meeting coming up um, we said May 2nd because that's the date mm -hmm. that this is going to come up on the, the agenda and I asked them you know to give us a response in advance of that they didn't commit to doing so um, but hopefully we'll hear back from them before then okay but they've you know they've got a process they've got a chain of command they've got to run everything up um, and that's why they usually take quite a while to come back with responses. Okay, so how do other board members feel about Virginia's suggestion that we wait until the 22nd to, to try to get some more uh, confirmation from 
the parties about what's going to happen and do our recommendations at that point. And to invite the neighborhood. Yes. I agree. I agree. Okay, I think that... C could we... W would the board members mind just taking a poll so the planning board knows where our minds are at because they are going to be meeting this week to determine their... finalize their path forward? Straw poll? That, well, like I said, I'm, I'm, I, uh, I mean, uh, I'm happy to offer it whether we do a poll or not. I am... Um, feeling supportive of this but I just feel that we need to get a couple more things in place and we need to we need to make sure the neighborhood is on board Aaron? yeah I'm okay with that I'm supportive <coughs> okay George? yes supportive. okay yeah I'm supportive too I mean whatever we whatever information we can get um, to help us know what it is we're agreeing to obviously is helpful <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that straw poll too, because we also have to represent <laughs> to the FinCon as well, because they were anticipating um, what your decision might be related to the developer agreement. So they wanted us to represent to them as well before taking a, another vote. Paul, okay. Paul, can we formally notify the neighborhoods that we're going to yeah, ask we'll, for their input? On yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll we get. have we have two. We'll start that process tomorrow morning. We'll, Thank get, that, you. we'll get that out. We'll spread the word. We'll spread the word for us. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, I think uh, that pretty much covers everything we have on that topic, which moves us past topic A2 since we're not going to take the recommendation on MBTA um, the, on that article. And um, um, I did trade emails with Doreen Deschler over the past couple of days, and she will also be here on the 22nd to make a presentation about her Warren article, the Citizen Petition Warren article. So we can move on next to the letter and testimony that we sent to the Joint um, Do you want me here for anything else? Legislative Committee on Bonding, Capital Expenditures, and State Assets. In our meeting packet is the letter as it was finalized su subsequent to our okay. special meeting last week. Mm -hmm. And Virginia, if you want to talk a little bit about the testimony that you gave, up that would be <laughs> helpful um, if you want I to. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I basically, uh, Pat was not able to be there when they called on us, so I, um, my testimony was really around the, the letter that we wrote. And uh, I went through, I emphasized the front end points of the letter with respect to taking away local authority and the infrastructure. And, um, and then I just went through some of the other bullets a little more quickly. And I also, um, you saw in the article, they also picked up on uh, questioning the number of units across the state that would be built because we have an estimate of potentially 4,500 in Chelmsford alone. Um, I don't know what else you want me to say. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 yeah, I mean, I didn't, obviously, like I said, I, I couldn't watch it. I had a, another event I had to get to, but um, and, you and, know, the thing and that I read, you did a, an excellent job. Well, thank you. And um, I'll just also mention Sam Chase gave some verbal testimony as well as written testimony. Uh -huh. So um, that was helpful to have that reinforced. And the, the gentleman from the planning board in Lowell, I thought, did an excellent job as well. Gary, Gary, Gary yeah. 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 Um, and I will mention one thing um, at last week's planning board meeting the the planning board had, had talked about the the letter also and the and the testimony and made a suggestion that we resubmit it with their signatures on it and I you know I don't know how the rest of the board feels about this but I'm not I'm not crazy about that idea we've already sent ours to where we sent it if they want to reference it in a letter that they might write I'm fine with that um, and if they want to send it to others, then, then what we send it to, if they wanted to attach it to a letter, they might send. I'm okay with that. I don't know if anybody has any comments about that. I mean, I don't think we want to resend, resend ours under, under those circumstances. Hmm. No, I, I, I agree with that, Pat. I, we had to get it submitted in time for the right. testimony, so I think it would, um, if there's another reason why we want to use this letter, <laughs> 
for some other audience and we want to coordinate joint signatures, I'd be happy to do that. And I am also happy to have them circulate it to more people and attach it um, with their support. I, I have a I'm sorry, when you're done with that, I have a uh, question. Um, go ahead. I just, Paul, I have a question about this article that you sent out. It mm -hmm. says that the MMA supports Governor Haley's housing bond bill, and I know that's the whole bill, but do we know what they submitted or if they submitted for the ADUs? Because I was under the impression they were going to have a presence at this hearing and nobody was there. I've not seen it. With the, with the MMA's position has been consistent that they don't support anything that takes away local control of zoning. Okay. Um, but... But beyond that, they support the the entirety of the bill, meaning the the, the vast majority of the bill's provisions, you know, which provides significant investment in in housing in the Commonwealth. Um, but they support everything as then their policy of local option, you know, for, for the for the example, the ones that you can provide the surcharge for uh, affordable housing, and but they also reach oppose anything that takes away local zoning, such as the ADU by right. Uh, and they've tried to make that clear. But they've not published, as you, as you noted, written their written testimony. Um, yeah, it's a little bit contra I think yeah. they might feel a little bit torn on this one, so they're right. not too public about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, listening listening to the testimony as, as much as I did listen, there are, you know, so many good things in it. Exactly. But it seemed like they tried to kind of slip something in that, maybe didn't relate to the other things that they were trying to do, or, or maybe they feel like it did. I don't know. But. Okay, so we'll move on to our next topic, which is um, the, the letter that I have drafted for the Cobblestone Place um, proposed 40B. This is the one that needs to be sent, that is, is, well, should, is to be sent to um, mass housing in response to their letter from us asking for comments so far that development is the only one this is under number 10 yeah um, they're the only one of the three 40 B's that we have um, had meetings about that uh, have gotten to the point where mass housing has asked for our letter so this is what I have come up with as far as the inputs that we have gotten uh, when we when we did the site visit with Michael Busby, um, he said that everything should be in one document. He prefers that to having attachments and things like that. So I try to consolidate everybody's comments into this letter. Uh, if anybody has any comments, um, I can make edits. Anything? Of course. You know I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, did I have a misspelling? I hope that's all. No, it is. no, <laughs> no. And. Uh, so um, at the opening where we say it's a five unit proposed 40B development on 1.05 acres, I didn't know if we should put just a statement in there that says due to the shape of the lot, the five units proposed would be on approximately 0.9 acres. Yeah, I, I guess I would not say not that care. because um, the, the whole, it, the parcel is 1.05. That's and if, fine. If somebody That's were fine. doing a single family, it would be the same thing. Mm -hmm. so. um, with respect to the neighbor comments, um, there was a, I don't, and again, I don't know how much of this you want to put in there, Pat, but we did have someone speak up about um, potentially hazardous conditions backing out of the driveway next door because of the proximity of the road to, to their driveway. Mm -hmm. um, there were neighbor, the neighbors were concerned about the proximity of the wastewater or the septic treatment to a neighbor's well. They were concerned about having a single entry or exit for emergency access. And then I think um, the Cindy, who was a, the retired firefighter EMT, she had she had made like four points, and I don't know if if or how many you want to include there, but one was the width of the road and whether the the exact number of 20 feet is going to be acceptable when there's delivery trucks and snow banks and things that might drive the width below 20 feet. One was with respect to the um, being in the aquifer protection zone, which I think you you touched on that somewhere, did you not? I, I think in the, um, I was pretty sure I did, yeah. The nor I thought um, it was under North Chelmsford Water District, but I don't see it there. 
there were, she raised a concern about the eradication of trees that filtrate the, the p potential contaminants coming down from Route 3. And then she also, I don't, again, I don't, we don't have the facts of it, but she referenced the 20 years ago, the Mass DEP um, issued something that's, that wanted to prevent developers from in, in zone two regions, which this is. Um, so, and, and I can, if you want, I can just um, type this up for you, but I didn't know if we would want to include any of the um, board comments. So, like, I, I still feel that they ought to look at um, handicapped adas adaptability in the in the affordable unit, and I'm still concerned about the unit density because it equates to about 0.18 acres per unit, and the existing pre-existing non-conforming single-family homes are at 0.3 acre lots. And then uh, the other the other concern that that I had raised was about just the, the straight use of evergreens and we would want them to really work a little bit more on the foliage with our DPW or the the tree committee. But Pat, just for the record, George is recusing himself yeah, from, yeah, the, yeah, from yeah. the discussion because he's right. about legal about right, it. So yeah. that's that's Thank what's you. going on. Yeah. So yeah, I mean that's I, all I had. I don't know how much of that you want to put in there, but I, I I, mean, I, I, guess I am. I, I am concerned about. I am concerned about the density. I understand they can do a higher density than what's normally required, but I still think that five units at 0.1 acres, one eight acres per unit is excessive. is something that I would like the ZBA to look closer at. Okay. I mean, I guess I'm going to ask Paul Haverty what MHP is kind of looking for in this response letter. Should it be that level of detail, and it should it be? Um, you know, board, um, I is, guess. Is it just department and neighbor comments, or is it board concerns, too? Well, no, it's absolutely board concerns, too. Okay. So what, what Mass Housing is going to do when they issue a project eligibility letter, they are basically going to regurgitate the concerns that the select board raise in their letter to them. <clears throat> and then they are going to instruct the Board of Appeals you may want to look into these issues as part of your review. Um, so it doesn't mean that the Board of Appeals can't look into whatever issues it wants to look at as part of its review, but it does help to provide some guidance. So it's better to have any suggestions that you have in the letter to Mass Housing. Um, I'm not suggesting that they're going to put every single one of them mm -hmm. into their project eligibility letter, but they do... <coughs> They, they put a significant number of, of concerns and, and comments into their letters and ask the Board of Appeals to review them as part of their process. Okay, because, I mean, something like th like density, I mean, it seems like that's the whole point of 40B is to increase density. So. Yes. So, so the density concern, I mean, again, I'm sure that the Board of Appeals will consider that as part yeah. of their review. I don't think that's going to move mass housing too much. Mm -hmm. The traffic concerns with regards to the... The, mm -hmm. the vehicles coming in and out, absolutely something, you know, mm -hmm. that should be pointed out and that the Board of Appeals should be instructed to review as part of their process. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, like, the, the neighbors had also suggested even look at reconfiguring where you're putting the multifamily units on the highway side instead of right up against. I don't know if those types of things come in or do we just leave it up to the community to go comment to the ZBA I, it doesn't hurt to point that out to Mass Housing, that suggestion, um, but very likely it's going to be addressed as part of the process with the okay. Board of Appeals. Okay. Anybody else have any comments on the letter? Okay. Okay. How about if I, I'll make updates, yeah, I'll send it to I'll you, and then, you, and then you can, we can get it. Uh, you know, I want to get it. It's due the 15th, so we got to do it the next couple of days, right? It's due the 16th, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. All right. Thank you for doing that, Pat. That's what I'm here to do. <laughs> okay, George, you can come back. 
And we're going to have another regulatory agreement. We're getting good at these, too. So, Paul Cohen, do you want to tell us about these, or is Paul yeah, Heppity going to do it? Just, just real quick, the um, what's being sought here is the board's approval of a regulatory agreement in the local action unit application for affordable housing at 3 Meeting House Road. Let me give you some background on this, and I think Paul sat in at the planning board hearings on this. Um, basically, this is a rental housing development on the 1.6 acre site at 3 Meeting House Road, which is off of Fletcher Street. Um, there's eight rental dwellings, and two of the units will be affordable under the, under the agreement. Um, and what this is is seeking this submittal is to seek the inclusion of these units on the town subsidizing housing inventory. So the planning board's already approved this project. They've already, um, uh, appeal period has lapsed and so forth. And, and so now in order to get this onto the, our subsidized housing inventory, we have to submit this development agreement and the local unit application. Um, and going back to this one, this does have the affordable units are at 50% of the eligible um, AMI. So that's what's being sought here is basically the planning board has fulfilled its role in terms of a hearing and so forth. Um, and abutters were notified, the project was approved. Now what the town's responsibility is and interest is is to submit this regulatory agreement and the local action unit program application in order to apply these units uh, onto our subsidized housing inventory. Um, same thing as, as council noted earlier, this will this will be valid for a year from the date of the planning board's approval um, and I think the expectation is is that they will uh, move forward with this project because they went through a considerable hearing process to get these units uh, constructed uh, and uh, if anything they, they probably would, would want to do more at that site than, than, than to walk away from this so that's what's being sought mm -hmm. uh, your approval this evening to um, for the regulatory agreement and then the submission for the local action units Okay, and this one should, like you said, should move more quickly because there's no real new construction, right? It's just changing the insides of the right. buildings. Exactly. And the abutters are commercial. Yes, yeah. So there's a lot of, yeah. How do they address sewer on something like that where you're going from an office use to a residential use? That was part of the calculation when they were for the planning board was the sewer usage from the site and then what would be required under this. And I believe they were they were compliant with the sewer requirements. Really? I would imagine an office probably is about the same as a residence, right? Mm -hmm. On an average day. Depending on how many residents. Yeah. Depending on how many residents. I know there's formulas that, yeah. to that effect. Right. That I just wondered. Okay, any other questions? You ready for a motion? Yeah, sure. Um, I will. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> Where am I? I will make a motion to. We're at number 11. Um, approve the regulatory agreement and local action unit application for affordable housing at 3 Meeting House Road as presented. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a, and a second. All in favor? Thank you. All right. Thank you. So. Madam Chair, you don't need me for anything else, do you? I, I think we are done with you, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So now it's time for our town accountant. Thank you so much for waiting all night <laughs> to make a presentation. Good evening. Um, first, I want to congratulate George for his re-election to the board and Pat to your election to the board. Welcome. Um, I promise I'm not going to talk about any housing because I think we're all done with housing Thank tonight, you. right? We'll talk about where we are in the fiscal year 24's um, revenue and expenditures. It's crazy that we're getting almost uh, at the end of our fiscal year. Um, we'll first talk about where we are at revenues. Um, we are actually doing really well this year, um, even though you're hearing everything with the state level, how things aren't doing very well, but 
the town's faring very well with their revenues. These, what I'm showing you here is through February. By the time I was doing these, we didn't have all the revenues posted for March. So I'm giving you revenues through February. The ex when we get to the expenditures, they actually are through March because we do those real time. But the um, re revenues, we have to um, enter those through. We have to wait through all the bank statements and everything come in through the Treasury Department to get those entered in. And they usually weren't entered all in and posted by the time I was doing these reports. But we are a um, $160 million budget. We are 73.6% collected of, our, of that budget. Uh, so we're above what our benchmark of 66% is at this time, um, what we should be at this time this year in February. Uh, one of the biggest local receipts that we have is motor vehicle. Uh, motor vehicle is doing very well. We've collected 42.3% of the $5.6 million that we have budgeted. Uh, to date, we've collected 2.3. We've received a total. We have a total commitment this year of a 5.2 million dollars. So we will be collect, and so um, we should be able to be collecting most of those through the end of March. We get a that was when when the bills were the motor vehicles were due. So um, when you when I send you out March reports, you'll see that we've we'll be collecting most of those motor vehicle. We did get a small um, commitment, a second commitment. It's actually not that small. It's just under $700,000. Those bills were out in April, uh, so they'll be, be due in May. And then the total com um, commitments are actually running about $500,000 above prior year, or nine, nine point, almost 10% almost higher than the prior year. So car sales are still doing well. Um, I think the cost, most people when they're buying vehicles now, they're probably buying electric vehicles, which are more expensive. Uh, so it's just bringing up the, the motor vehicle excise revenue there. Uh, local option meals tax. Uh, again, we're our, our first and second quarter, we've totaled about uh, just a little under uh, $460,000. Seen some really strong uh, collections there. Mails are up actually 12% from prior year. Um, so we, sh we should be exceeding our $800,000 budget by about $100,000 by the end of the fiscal year is our prediction, prediction there. Same thing with hotel uh, room occupancy tax. Uh, we're about 300, just a little over $300,000 of collection there. Um, we're s about 7.5% higher than prior year. And again, we should see about a, a, an additional $100,000 collected by the end of the fiscal year of that budget. Building permits, uh, this is where it's really helping out our bottom line and our local receipts. Um, we had estimated about $1.65 million of collections, but we actually, through February, collected $2.4 million. Uh, the West Campus, uh, the UMass West Campus pulled their permit. That was uh, just a little over a million dollars right there for our permit fee. So it's like one of those things that you have, it's a one-time <laughs> We've seen that when with with uh, with scientific fish when they were they came in with their million dollars with that one time, but it's a nice it helps our bottom line for the fiscal year. And it will help our free cash. Uh, so we've uh, you know we've already exceeded our budget already by just a little over eight hundred thousand dollars. So we'll be doing well in, in that line item. And the same thing we've we've seen a great um, increase in our interest investment line items, uh, a significant amount from prior year. We're almost 90% higher than we were prior year. So as the market's doing better, uh, it's stabilizing, rates a little bit of a bump in the interest rates, um, just in a stabilized market has really helped with our, with the, our interest investments. Yeah. And as always, um, our finance director of tax collection, John Sousa, does a marvelous job with our property tax collection. So I see no problems with that tax collection rate. Any questions when you're going through? If you just, I just, anybody has any questions in certain line items? Um, the next few pages are just the, the report that just shows you the, the separate line items that we have in the budget. Um, state, state collection, everything else is, is looking fine. I don't see any, any concern with revenues this year at all. I think we'll do very well fair for our bottom line. Expenditures, again, we're within the, the right at about the 65% expended line where we should be like 66. Uh, we are going to, this is the time of year I reach out to the departments before town meeting 
where do they, you know, going to need a budget increase for the current fiscal year? We did have some some departments that didn't have are going to need budget adjustments that are going to be on the Warren article at town meeting. So we needed about four hundred and eighty-eight thousand dollars worth of budget adjustments. Um, a, a lot of them are for personnel um, because we're having some retirements coming up. Um, we've uh, in the police, and we've had some um, retirements there. They're having a hard time bringing those officers, new officers on in time, so overtime's running a little bit high. So we just have a little bit of personnel um, budget requests that we need. And then there's just a few um, expenditures also that have come up during the course of the year that weren't budgeted at the beginning of the fiscal year. Um, one of the things under the municipal, we had a fire station study. We had some website support services that we need to hire. And then we had some property assessments um, that we're hiring consultants to go out and do and do some abatement claims. So those are just really the, we, it's, usually, it's usually just a housekeeping um, that we just go through the departments. It's hard for them to budget at the beginning of like they're, they're budgeting for this fiscal year and then a year, a year and a half down and you know things come up within in, within the departments that people need. We are going to be taking this money um, from we're taking four hundred thousand dollars from the uh, finance committee reserve, and then the eight hundred thousand is eighty-eight thousand is going to come from the snow and ice. We do have it. Um, we'll have a reserve in the snow and ice because we had a mild year, so there'll be some money that we can actually recoup some money from to cover the budget increases. Any questions on the expenses, people? I just wanted to show, I know we, we just for some warning goggles, where we are with, with sewer enterprise and stormwater enterprises. When you're looking at this, it looks like we're running, a, they're running a deficit. Again, these, the revenues are through February, but the expenses are March. So the expenses, of course, are running a little bit higher. Um, but last year's revenues, um, we've already exceeded what we've brought in from the prior year. So I, I have n don't have any concern with their revenues coming in. Um, Christine Clancy does a great job managing um, the DPW's budgets along with sewer and stormwater. We don't see any problem. They're not going to have any problem with their expenditures either. Um, and they do have a current undesignated fund balance, which is like their free cash amount. They get certified every year. When I close out the books, they have their own undesignated fund balance of free cash, and currently there's about eight hundred and ninety-eight thousand dollars in that account. Um, so, and then we'll just add. Last year, they had, they run they ran kind of tight. They only added about one hundred and seventy thousand dollars to their undesignated, um, but at least they did end in the, the end of their, their their the year in the black. So, and I see the same thing for this year. It may not be a large sum of money, but they will be. Get, be having a certified free cash amount. Uh, same thing with the stormwater. Um, this runs. This just this runs very tight. It's not a. It's not as big as sewer. Um, they have an undesignated fund balance or free cash currently of three hundred and forty-five thousand um, dollars. And at this point, they're running the same. They're they're kind of running the same thing. That their revenues are less than what they have expended. But again, these revenues are only through February. Um, I'm sure if I had matched, if I do the, when I do the March, March and March, those, they'll be running in the black. They won't be running in the red. I still, again, at the end of the fiscal year, I don't see any concern. They'll probably have a very small free cash amount that will add to what they currently already have. Last year was just a little over $10,000, so they run, they run very tight. And the PEG excess, or the telemedia, um, they currently have certified of their free cash last year of $536,000. So that's what they have in there. They run a really tight ship and because they're just running basically off the revenues that, that we pay on the, the cable and telephone bills. And they, um, they're going to be asking, you'll see there's a town meeting, they're going to be asking for some funding um, getting together with Pete, he has some computer servers that he needs to buy and some new cameras and camcorders and things. So he's looking for 40K currently for some computer services he needs to upgrade to get some, um, to run the, 
run the station, and then about um, eighteen thousand dollars for some cameras and corn camp camcorders that he's going to be asking, and those will be will just come from his un undesignated fund balance, which he has plenty for. And then the last fund I thought I would just touch base with you is where we are with CPC. Um, this first sheet, I'm very, I'm sorry that it's, it's so small, but these are just basically all of the projects that we currently have on the books, even for projects that may have already been completed, but we actually still have debt. Um, we have, some of these go all the way out to the, to 2030 to pay for. So you'll see there's a line item in there for always for the, the debt and interest payments that we have. Um, and then of course, one of the big projects that we took on last year was Coolest Farm, the purchase. We haven't borrowed the money yet. We will be borrowing that in June. I just did just show on here that we will have a bond proceed coming in for $4.1 million. It's going to be covering the cost of that purchase of the property. Um, so these are just all of basically. What, what's the color coding? So the color coding, um, basically the yellow is debt. So those, those were the articles that were funded at town meeting to cover the debt. So I just kind of make that okay. for myself. I make that yellow so that I know that's debt. And then the orangey ones are just, they were just town meeting articles that um, had separate articles. They weren't part of the main article. They were actually separate articles. So we had a separate article for Coolers Farm for $50,000 that was to just for administrative costs that came up on that project. And then we had um, the town clerk had the vault shelving um, article that was at last town meeting, and that's the amount that we allocated for those. So I just kind of keep it separate, just for myself, so I know what's what's bond, what's going to be um, bond, uh, debt payments. The middle part of this is actually the revenues that we get in. So we had a Commitment. The commitment on for CPC was just a little, just a little under um, 1.5 million dollars. To date, we've collected a million dollars, so we have a receivable balance out of out there about 390 thousand dollars. That will be collected by the end of the fiscal year. There will still be a small amount, but we end up again always collecting. If you look under where the fiscal 24, if you look under 20, 22 and 23, how we have just small balances, um, those do get collected from the tax collection um, at some point. And even if they go into into tax collection, we, we we still end up getting it when it goes into even tax title. We'll still receive those payments. The interest income there is $20,000, and then we're, our state match this year was 295472 It's a little less than what we've been receiving from the past years, but more communities are joining CPC when that happens. Our, the state match goes down because more communities are taking a piece of the pie. And the third piece of this is really all the fund balances. The top, the, the top three there, um, where it says CF and then open space historical, those are actually the projects that are currently open in those three categories. I split them out, put them in those three categories. So it totals about $1.3 million worth of after, after projects. Like I said, some of them may be just the debt. They may not be worked on, they're just the, the debt that we owe on it too. Then we have the reserve. There's about, we have about a balance of 945000 And then in our undesignated fund balance, it's kind of like the free cash balance amount, the amounts that we set aside, um, is just a little under $4 million. And that can be used, again, if we were going to purchase another piece of property, or we've got also got to remember that CPC, debt has to be paid from CPC. It, we always have to set money aside. If for some reason CPC goes away, we still are on the hook for the debt. So it's always good to probably have some money set aside so that this can, can, can we always have money to continually pay for debt if this actually goes away and you wouldn't have to raise it through another appropriation. The three on the bottom, those are the 10 percenters that we put the 10 percent in at town meetings, part of the main article. You can see it again this year. With the um, CPC's um, 
always has recommended is they put the 10 percents in then they take the 10 percents back out to cover debt on any of those three if um to those three buckets so if we put in one hundred forty thousand dollars we may be taking one hundred forty thousand dollars out of that or say open space or whatever to cover the debt and you've found you've seen those i think in the articles how do we go in and then again then we just pull them back out and it's just a good way of actually covering the debt um, instead of taking it out of a reserve or undesignated, you can just put them right, take them right out of the ten percent buckets. Um, and this, this is probably the strongest we've seen this CPC. Um, they're doing really well. And when we do go through, um, when we do borrowings, when John does the borrowings, they always ask and, and kind of run John through the mill a little bit about how much is in the fund, and we need to show that we do have a good fund balances in these accounts especially when we do big projects like that one we did with Coolest Farm. So it's, it's, it's probably the healthiest it's been for a while. And that's really where we are in 24. It's going to be good. Um, if I, you know, I, I know I never like to tell you what I think free cash is going to be, but I think we'll probably be looking at another two and a half. Um, I would think two and a half million on free cash could be a little bit more depending how, if these revenues continue to keep being strong like that. Any questions? I hope your prediction is accurate. <laughs> I think it will be. Okay. It's pretty to be true. <laughs> it, with the with just with the um, the amount that came in for the for the permitting that will help us right there. There's there was a million that we really weren't expecting. So at this at, you know we were expecting it, but it's it was a time good timing for mm -hmm. us for this year. Sure. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Next up is uh, appointment of select board member to the um, new open space and recreation plan committee. Um, I had volunteered to take this temporarily. I, I think I kind of would like to keep it. Um, so, um, and but that kind of brings us to. I was going to talk about it in my in my referrals, but uh, we can talk about it now as far as. Um, liaison assignments. When when Mark left, we all took on extras. So I guess I would ask for our our next meeting. You know, maybe if by say next Monday or so, everybody could get me except Pat, since he doesn't have any liaisons right now. Get me a list of the ones you want to you want to keep, or you might want to change, or the might might want to give up to Pat. So get a you know give him good ones now. Up with some offerings for you. See which ones he <laughs> wants. Well, I mean, if you have some that you that you specifically want, yeah, let us know that too. Yeah. Oh, that, sure. yeah. That, there's no doubt. Yeah. Um, yeah. One or two that I would like to. Sure. It might be helpful to um, send out an old list where Mark was on it, so we could see. Yeah. Okay. I can do that. What people actually had before okay. that change. Okay. Yep. Yeah. All right. So I will send mm -hmm. uh, a blank one out and and that out um, later this week, so you all can look at that. And yeah, my plan then would be to to remain on the open space and recreation unless anybody has a a strong desire to to do that. Okay, very good. All right, next on our agenda is uh, this draft um, proclamation for parents of kids with cancer, um, and the uh, attached email that uh, Amanda Barnes had had sent to us about why she wanted to set this uh, this date. Um, there is no organization that um, that promotes this. Uh, she just um, thought it would be a, a good idea for the community to recognize parents with kids with cancer um, and picked the date of um, April 22nd because it's meaningful to her. Um, on April 20th, there's going to be a program at the CCA where she wanted to be able to present this proclamation to some local folks that have lost kids with cancer. So there is some time, time sensitivity to it. But per our policy, this would be our first read of this proclamation. Just want to see if anybody has any, um, any additional edits before we sign it and send it back to Amanda to present. The only thing I see is on the second. Um, it's probably whereas, some. I I've think it means to say day yep. instead of say. Yep, that's been changed. There's, there's several others, yeah. too. 
There was one in the last sentence, too, a typo in the last sentence. Right, there was just a, yeah. A paragraph a, that didn't belong. Yeah, a stray A or something, yeah. Yep. So if everybody's okay with that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think at our, at our next uh, meeting on April 22nd, we can include that in our public service announcements to be read publicly. Okay, I don't remember, did we take a vote on this? I don't think so. I think we just say we're going to review it. Okay. All right. So we will move on to appointments. Paul, oh, that's yours. Yeah, just re real quickly, we, we've got two appointments for your, the board's confirmation this evening. The first one is the Commission on Disabilities, the seeking the board's confirmation of the appointment of Derek Jones, who's a resident of Newfield Street, um, to the Commission on Disabilities um, for a term ending June 30th, 2026. And then the second one is Christine McNamara, who's a resident of High Street, to the Tree Committee for a term ending June 30th, 2025. Okay, any questions about either of these applicants? Okay. I will. Do I have to do one at a time or can you I do can them both? both. You can do I both. will make a motion to approve the town manager appointments, uh, Derek Jones to the Commission on Disabilities and Christine McNamara to the Tree Committee as presented. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, very good. Okay, um, next on our agenda is if we want to do any more, or any, we haven't done any yet, any town meeting um, recommendations. Um, it being almost nine o'clock, um, I guess I would suggest we hold all of these for our next meeting, Paul, unless there's some other really, what do we have for our next meeting? We know we have the, the MBTA thing. Um, yeah, um, you know, you'll have your monthly, Christine Clancy will be in with your opera d updates. Um, you may have Paul McKinley for the um, PFAS updates. So there's a few things that are pending for the next meeting. As I said, so I, I, I don't want to give the board the assurance that, you're, you know, the next meeting will be any shorter of duration than this one, but it's really different subject matters. Uh, okay. As you said, um, the liaison assignments, uh, board's meeting schedule. Right, yeah, that was going to mention those that, Those will be too. the items yeah. that, um, that will, will, you know, come up uh, next meeting. Um, but in terms of the town meeting recommendations, um, Virginia sent out the results. The Finance Committee is recommending all articles. The only one, as was noted earlier this evening, that they have not acted upon is the MBTA zoning. And all the Finance Committee votes were unanimous. Uh, there were a couple with one abstentions for, for a couple personal reasons, so forth. But um, so I don't, you know, I don't anticipate that there'll be significant uh, concerns. Because you're right, if you leave it to next meeting, then we, we, you don't we, have, you're we, not, we, yeah, we don't, you don't have, have a choice else. to put it off after right, that, exactly. right? So, um, so I will leave it up to other board members. We can either spend another 15 minutes doing some, or we can start fresh at our next meeting. That would be my preference, but I'm okay either way. Yeah, I wouldn't mind waiting. Okay. Is there anything? I don't. I don't feel like there's anything else in here that's even relatively kind of contentious. No, right? and that's why. Even MBTA. one that might be worth kind of discussing quickly now before we go home and get to pour over. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought it was surprising that there's, what, 16 art articles on the consent agenda? Mm -hmm. yeah. That's, that's oh. phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. Well, because I think most of them are the regular recurring articles at <laughs> Springtown meeting, uh, and in, in the moderator sense was we'll put it out there and if anybody wants to pull something off of it they can but I think the expectation is we'll be there two nights first night dealing with the budget and approvals and all the articles and then the second night as was noted earlier tonight will probably be MBTA zoning um, if that moves forward um, you know so I think that's that's the expectation which is why I think you'll probably be have a select board meeting that following Monday the May 6 because right. the expectation mm -hmm. is they'll finish in two sessions Okay, so you two guys okay with holding till our next meeting to get started on those? George? I no, you want to stay here another hour and a half, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I'd rather. <laughs> I know. Study. <laughs> okay, we do have one set of meeting minutes to, uh, to look at. 
for March 25th. Anybody have any comments? Um, Edits? I, I do. Okay. So on, on page four in the discussion about the cobblestone place um, public input session, it says um, Cindy Lazinski of Agilon Ave appeared before the board and gave her perspective on the project. She read from her written statement, hereby made a part of these minutes. And she did hand, I, I went back and watched it. She did hand you okay, you're the right. statement, but it's when I had asked James for the inputs from the residents, that wasn't part of it, and it's not listed in the supporting documents. Okay, I'll, yeah, I'll get so that. So he, he's I'll got the holy inputs in the supporting okay. documents, but I think um, Cindy's need to be included too. Okay, yeah, I thought she gave those to everybody. Okay, I will, I will take care of that. Anything else? I will make a motion to approve the regular meeting minutes from March 25th, 2024 as with as amended. Yeah, as amended. as amended. As amended. As amended. Thank you. Uh, second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Stay. Okay. All right. We are to liaison reports and referrals. George. Oh. Okay. okay. Um, Pat. It's, it's a great. surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Aaron, what do you have? No, I don't have anything. Okay, Virginia. Um, Pat mentioned the open space and recreation plan. They're going to be kicking off that project on April 16th. Um, the Strategic Plan Steering Committee reviewed seven submitted proposals and we've um, invited a short list for interviews later this month. And uh, the Fire Station Study Committee is um, finalizing its final report for town meeting. Paul and Chief Ryan are working on getting some estimates from Weston and Sampson for the station rebuilds. Um, and Chief Ryan is also in the process of a grant application to help support staffing needs. And then I just, um, I wanted to request a, a potential agenda topic um, for one of our upcoming meetings. And that is, um, I was wondering if we could look at the select board LIP policy requirement to notify abutters within seven days because I feel like that's kind of short and most of the statutes for regular hearings require two weeks and I'm, I'm, I would just like to um, potentially okay. have the board consider changing that from seven to 14. Okay. All right, um, I have a couple of things. Uh, first, congratulations to former Sergeant Bill Carlo who was recently uh, promoted to Lieutenant. Congratulations to him. Um, <clears throat> Last week there was a ribbon cutting at the Glam Beauty Lounge at 10 Chelmsford Street, um, a new beauty salon in town, and they do really good work, so I'll stop by and see them. And um, last week I was at um, an event with uh, Congresswoman Trahan where she um, an announced nominations to service academies, including uh, one to Navin Ramesh, who lives in North Chelmsford. He goes to Central Catholic High School in Lawrence, um, but he's a, a star in his class, and I'm sure he'll do well at the service academies. He still has to go through the uh, um, acceptance pro uh, process, but uh, based on his background, I feel confident that he will, so congratulations to Navin. And the only other thing is, uh, as Paul mentioned at our next meeting, we'll be looking at the calendar of our meetings for the remainder of this year. So if you have holidays or vacations coming up, be sure to um, have those available so we can try to work around when people might be out of town. And that's it for tonight, I think. So I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. We are adjourned. <laughs>